This is the Amp Hour Podcast, released July 29th, 2018, episode 401, an interview with Brent and Bryce Salmi. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. I'm Bryce Salmi of Faraday RF and Relativity Space. And I'm Brent Salmi of Faraday RF and a uh, air transportation startup, Stealth Mode. <laughs> Welcome. The brother Salmi, how you doing? <laughs> hey, doing well. <laughs> do, do people refer to you as that? I always thought like the brothers <laughs> something, you know, is always like a, you know, interesting way to do it. Yeah, like, like Brent and Bryce or yeah, yeah. like it, it, it varies. Right. So um, I was talking about you guys the other day uh, in, in preparation for this interview. And I am, uh, it's awesome that you guys are, you know, obviously brothers, uh, you're tw- twins, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yep. So twins, but you also are both EEs and you ended up kind of just like on a very <laughs> parallel path. And like that, <laughs> that must have been studying easier. I don't know. I don't know. Like, was it easier or harder? I don't know. It's about as parallel as you can get. We, yeah. we both... We went to school for E, both went to RIT, uh, basically were in classes together, and then both took chances at applying to SpaceX um, uh-huh. and got those internships and eventually worked in the same group for five years. Like I sat next to, to Brent for like you know, like four and a half years. <laughs> yeah, we, awesome. we, we never planned this. It just sort of like kept happening and we just like, if we just didn't stop it, we're like, well, I guess we... We're another, both doing yeah, it the same another, thing. Let's keep going. Go. Here we go. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Both enjoying it. Like awesome. back in back in 2011 when we applied to SpaceX, it's like, well, we both got the offer. Like, you don't turn that down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like like it looks like we're working together. <laughs> yeah, so. that's crazy. Wow. Uh, so I assume you also uh, work together okay because you not only did that, but then you also went and you're like, hey, you know what? We should spend all our free time together too and do a side project for Ham Radio as well. Uh, Pretty much. Uh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we we, so. we sort of get along. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. And then yeah. actually, no, even before, no awkward reu- reunions here, right? It's uh, right. It's all good. Yeah. yeah we okay. t- we talk a lot. <laughs> like, um, I good. mean, even before Faraday, we actually did a lot of AMSAT work too for uh, amateur satellites. Oh, nice. So, okay. Uh, nice. Yes. Yeah, a few things in space there too. So uh, once was that, that wrapped uh, up, uh, we did thing, or is that like tied to SpaceX or what? Uh, more of an RIT thing, like our senior design project. Um, but then mm-hmm. it continued for about another two years after we graduated. Um, oh then, wow! Yeah, okay. and then like after, and then after, yeah, that's a, that's actually the whole story. But like then after that finished, we kind of like dove into to Faraday. And so, what is what is AMSAT? Uh, AMSAT's the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation. So um, they're basically a group that's been around since the early '60s. Um, putting amateur radio in space, in orbit. Um, they just started up in the last several years their uh, Fox series of satellites. And uh, those are just those have been the first AMSAT CubeSats, at least AMSAT North America. And uh, been wildly successful as far as I know. It really helped standardize uh, their efforts. And, you know, it, it helped them adapt to a changing launch service environment. They used mm-hmm. to get launches basically for free or super low cost. And then once those, once CubeSats came around and, in you know, People like SpaceX came around and like and actually kind of changed the whole paradigm of the launch industry. Mm-hmm. Um, they really couldn't compete because now you know for what they got for free now it costs like three hundred thousand dollars. So and yeah. so this is like that service where basically if you're a researcher at a university, you want to put up a CubeSat, you want to put up just any s- satellite. You're saying that this would basically kind of do the logistical piece and also take it through up to this to launch or what? So AMSAT's its own group. So like they have their Fox series satellites where they. Um, they work with universities who want to do an experimental payload, and AMSAT will provide like a power bus, a, you know, batteries, uh, oh, you know, okay. commu- uh, basically right. the internal health and data monitoring and RF portion of the uh, satellite. And they get to AMSAT as a group, even though it's not a college or a university, gets to apply for NASA uh, Ilana grants or Atlanta grants, uh, which okay. are mainly for universities to get free launches. Um, but since they have ex- hosted payloads, um, for, you know, say like Vanderbilt university or, you know, any one of those, they actually count as a school. So then they can get the free launch. But, you know, one of the things that usually fails for most university built CubeSats is like the RF link, like RF is very hard. So right. Amateur radio gets a satellite in space that does science in the background or for a couple months. And then once that mission's done, it goes to full time, you know, transponder mode. Um, and is just another you know, satellite in space, which is uh, which is great for for amateur radio. 
Hmm. Oh, that's great. Okay. And so then that's the standardization of the Fox Fox series you're saying is that it basically serves the amateur radio community by like, so what does that do then? Then it's just like a downlink or an uplink or what is, what is uh, the both, actual both use? Downlink, uplink. Yeah. Uh, Brent, do you want to mm-hmm. add anything to that? Because I mean, you worked on it uh, yeah. extensively too. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So I, I guess the, the the best way to say the 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 Fox series uh, and its evolution is is it started it started off in in one U cube sats like little like literal cubes, uh, and its main point was to develop like the backbone of battery system, RF system, computing, uh, the ability to put your experimental um, electronics and tests on it from 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 universities, and uh, the universities do their experiments in, in space and and we provide a data link down you can you can command the the cubesat on the uplink as well uh, but when when the satellite experiment is does not need high speed data um, uh, you can put the satellite into a full time amateur radio use uh, where you can get slow speed telemetry data from the satellite as you need it but the main primary uh, um, transmission is actually voice links up and down and the way that most cubesats today uh, most amateur radio satellites work today um, is just a, a, what we what you call a bent pipe so you transmit on one frequency up to the satellite and it trans it retransmits you in real time um, uh, uh, down to earth. So the effect of that is having is like you transmit up to the CubeSat and it makes you look like you're a couple hundred miles above the sky. So you're talking on your little walkie talkie. And instead of talking just to your local town, you have the ability to talk to, you know, half of the country. So like, what was the, their business model? Were they like a nonprofit or they, they actually had a yeah. business model in there? Yeah, too? they've been a nonprofit, non-profit. for, yep. Um, okay. And then their whole business model was basically getting amateur radio into space and yeah. uh space nerds, space nerds wanting yeah. to do space things yeah yeah, uh, yeah, no, they, great. They, yeah. i mean the first amsat satellite went up i think about four years after sputnik i mean they were early holy early crap yeah. okay and um like maybe some be, insiders at nasa a oh, couple yeah, of those J- space JPL, nerds also Lockheed yeah. people yeah, Lockheed, yeah. and um right. it's yep. it's funny because like i would often see some of those like cubesats on um kickstarter years ago and be like oh the first open source you know first you know you know, you know volunteer built satellites like no that means 60s yeah, that was done yeah, right. but anyway it's like the first like marketed one but um but yeah like you know amsat until about five years ago basically built one-offs like bigger you know 20 30 40 kilogram satellites they actually had built uh ao40 uh launched in 2000 was a 600 it's like, i think it was 600 kilogram satellite it's crazy big it had a 400 newton hypergolic thruster on it um it's basically if you think of like dragon spacecraft and from yeah. um, SpaceX, yeah. the same thrusters that are Drake, like that same technology, like a similar technology was on this amateur satellite. <laughs> like that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So the new one is like so you're saying the Fox is kind of like this. It's like a plug and play, almost like a like it's an Arduino header for scientific experiments, yeah. kind of. Yeah, that's actually a really yeah. great way of saying it. It allowed them to make yeah. like five or six of them really cheaply and get them into space real fast. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. And so so you're doing this in college. You kept going after college. Um, what what was the payload you were working on? Yeah, we did the uh, maximum PowerPoint tracker. So actually, all the files are up on GitHub. It's 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 public domain. Ooh, um, yeah, nice. Um, and that's and, for solar solar tracking and solar yeah. uh, so, maximum um, output. Yeah, so we did it as a senior design project, and uh, it's funny because I remember we were having a conversation because we had, with our teammates, and you know, because we knew this was a pretty crazy project to go into. Uh, a lot of our IT senior design project, you know, if, especially if they were ambitious, kind of usually like didn't work out or whatever. And we were like, we're going to put something in space. <laughs> and uh, I don't think a lot of people believed us. Um, and we knew this team would, like, we were, we eventually got known as the team that like never left. <laughs> um, we were always in the lab, always doing <laughs> stuff. Um, and, it. you know, yeah, yeah. one of the, one of the driving factors was we made that promise of like, okay, if you do this, if we achieve this, like, I like, we will get this in space. Like, and that took another two years after graduation to get in in space, and um, to actually go. Gee, from I can't like, imagine why SpaceX would have hired two, you know, two <laughs> plus people that are, you know, really dedicated yeah. to getting stuff into space, no matter what. Okay, <laughs> pretty much. <Yeah. laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what is the so the MPP MPPT? Yep. Um, well, uh, that didn't exist. There, there wasn't a version of this already up up there. Or what? What was different about it? Or was it for that Fox system and then it got used over and over again? Um, so uh, 
it exists in, you know, AMSAT had actually made an MPPT for some prior satellites, but uh, didn't exist mm-hmm. in the CubeSat form factor. Uh, also, oh, cool. Yep. So, but also, most CubeSat, you can buy them for CubeSats, but most CubeSats are designed for six month missions. So, if, especially if you use things like uh, a microcontroller, um, you can get radiation bit flips and, you know, your code can literally change ones and zeros uh, due to radiation. And when you have a six month mission in low earth orbit, the chances that you get a bit flip in six months are pretty low. But AMSAT was aiming for a minimum of five years in, uh, operation mm-hmm. and most of the orbits uh, didn't re-enter for a good you know 10 or so years, if not more. So you can't take that assumption after you know a couple solar storms happen in five years and you know you're dead. So and you can't reprogram it. So um, we actually went and made an analog MPPT. So it actually is literally an analog computer. So it uses an op to do y equals oh. y equals negative mx plus b, um, and computes what the maximum power point voltage of the panel should be, and then use instead of doing feedback uh, from a DC to DC converter, it does essentially feed forward. Uh, or something like that, uh, to control the solar panel voltage, the input voltage, which is really kind of trippy. I remember Brent can probably, uh, you know, I- I explain how crazy this was, but it was like two in the morning at RIT in their senior design lab. Um, and we're just like racking our heads over how does this feed forward work? Like we knew we had to like figure this out. And then it finally hit us. Oh, like the solar panel has a, uh, has a like a large impedance, like thirty something ohms in this in the case for for AMSAT. So when you pull more current, the voltage drops. Okay, and then you can once we once that actually hit us, we're like, oh, now we know how to close the loop, and you can close that feedback loop. Nice. Yeah, the the, the uh, a nice way of saying it is uh, is it's basically it's it's kind of like a, like a normal DC to DC switching converter. Uh, that you would put 12 volts in and get 5 volts out, but it works in reverse. We're actually regulating the input voltage. And the Based voltage, on temperature of the solar panel. Yep, based on temperature of yeah. the solar panel. Um, oh. And we go all into why like this is this is actually pretty good and it gets you into pretty high efficiency. You can do things to get you higher efficiency, but um, we we used all COTS parts and COTS parts that had testing uh, radiation testing uh, backgrounds right now, that so. would last yeah. for the minimum minimum 30,000 rad and um, and and uh, and yeah, it, it it's literally that's, no, that's a great computer. idea. Yeah. Doing, it, doing it analog too yep. is like you know, there's fewer. I mean, obviously, there's still control systems that could could you know have issues with it, right? But it's you're using lots of bits, right? <laughs> or yep. lots of electrons at least <laughs> instead of single yeah. bits and single. Well, yeah. Well, so the actually, cool, a the... really key point. Oh, um, I guess a, a really key point there was that uh, the one of the reasons we did analog versus uh, a microcontroller is that um, it's it it avoided something called state. Uh, so it was a stateless design. State would be in a mm-hmm. microcontroller, like the, the saving of a variable to say what like what, what a value is or what it should be. That And that state could get changed. It could get corrupted. With an analog mm-hmm. MPPT that was constantly doing these computations and analog uh, analog math, really, um, it was, it, you know, if you had, if you had, um, some particle hit, hit the board and cause uh, a voltage or current spike, it, it quickly, the feedback would just correct it. You know, you know, if it hit a capacitor, it might, you might, it might cause a little bit of, 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 of a blip or, or a diode or something. Uh, but there was no state to save. It was constantly refreshing itself. So therefore yeah. that the main, one of the main benefits was that we believed it would, instead of failing suddenly, it would slowly degrade over time rather than failing yeah. suddenly. Yeah. And there's two in orbit right now. So one on AO91, um, that's been in orbit, I think for over a year now. And then another on AO92, um, that's I think just under a year. So yeah, one of these got launched on an Atlas V, I believe, and the other one got launched on a PSLV out of India. Which really, it was really weird to like watch the video feed from India, watch the PSLV go up, and be like, "Wow, I remember when I was like testing that literal board on that satellite on my kitchen table yeah. in Redondo Beach, California." <laughs> yep. Like, yeah. So, what what is that time gap there too between? Uh, the end of the project and the actual uh, launch. Like, what is that window? <laughs> yeah. So like, this kind of like that hurry up and wait thing because you're not the paying customer, right? And this is actually, this actually kind of leads oh, sure. a little bit yeah. into like relativity and like the, the small set whole like thing. But if you're not like the main paying customer, uh, you have to abide by everyone else. So uh, like for those launches, the main customers set the schedule. If you were not ready, you did not launch or, you know, like you, you lost your spot. Um, even if they ended up delaying in the end, like when, when they said you needed to get it integrated or, or like sent to them, you had to. So I think both of those spent like basically in like ready to go, like 
in the pea pod, I believe they probably spent like a year just sitting there waiting to go mm-hmm. and then finally launched. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, like, yeah, space is a long time. I mean, yeah. like all this, I'm always amazed at people. I remember when the JPL stuff, uh, the, the, the mission where they were flying past Pluto, right? Wasn't that the big Juno. one? They... No, sorry, not um, no, Juno. No. Um, New Horizons. New, uh, Deep, Deep Horizons. Yeah, Deep Horizons. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And it was like, yeah, p- these people have been doing this mission for like 15 years yeah. or something crazy like that. And it's like, oh my God, like that's, it's that's a, like it's a, a whole, they, it was like a whole career, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's just, man, that is, that is super impressive. Oh yeah. That was one of the things about SpaceX where like the experience you got, um, just like, like in five years was just like what other people, like you would see similar experience on like LinkedIn or something in like a 15, 20 year career. It was just like, yeah, when you move yeah. fast like that, like you know, move fast, fail fast, you know? Sure. Well, let's get, let's get towards that too. So how did, how did the AMSET stuff lead to the SpaceX stuff for obviously both of you? Uh, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Bryce, if you want to take it. Oh yeah. I was just going to let, letting you go. Um, Hmm. The yeah I, I yeah so um this it's is good this delay. is good I, I'll ex- I'll extend the delays <laughs> so they're they're extra awkward delays extra, extra long and right, painful right. yeah right. I'll just like like have my finger <laughs> tapping like all right all who's right. gonna well, answer this well, one well, um, you know what, what what's funny is that like uh, um Bryce and I. We, we, we tend to have similar thoughts and, and similar times of like when we want to, when we want to talk and we've been trying to do a really, really uh, a better job over the last couple of years of not like constantly speaking over each other by accident because we both have the same you know thing to say. And uh, um, so it's just funny. It's one of those twin things that we've just, you realize is more of a twin thing and uh, yeah. you know, so sometimes it <laughs> yeah, works. Me, me and Dave are just like that too. We talk over each other all the time. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, we're not twins. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yes. Uh, I mean, AMSA didn't necessarily lead into SpaceX. SpaceX was actually more of an RIT, like the uh, K2GXT, the RIT Amateur Radio Club that we we ran for, we ran for several years. Uh, we ended up doing a project called the, um, I guess we called it Richie One. It was a high altitude balloon back before high altitude balloons were like really popular. Um, and uh, yeah, so 2011. Are you a balloon hipster. I'm a balloon hipster. Exactly. Yeah, you just hipster hipsters. that. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh man. Uh, so like, so we actually did that project, um, with a bunch of people in almost everyone who worked on that project, I like, got an internship from it, which is really interesting. Wow. Um, they can like okay. literally cite like, oh yeah, they, they really liked this project and, you know, offered me something. Uh, so like, it was just like this really hands-on. We, we actually like, we, we, this is back when we hand etched boards, like Oshpark, like we didn't really know about Oshpark or anything. So that was like actually really painful to look back at some of the boards and look back at like how long it took to like eight hours to make a board that like that we then had to mm-hmm. drill the PCB holes. Um, so we're doing that project and Brent and I actually had this like, in retrospect, really good approach to it. Uh, now that I've worked in aerospace, which is we looked at the mission and said, we don't care about cool videos or pictures. We care about this surviving and res- responding back all the way to the ground. Like, you know, it it oh, okay. must not fail, right? So we didn't even put a camera on it until literally a week before, a week or two before launch, we applied for a little more funding from RIT and they gave it to us, gave us like a couple hundred bucks. And we like immediately went down to like Best Buy or something and like bought uh, a, a GoPro at, at that time. And then like, epoxied it on the side you mean like that's the you're saying you prioritize certain pieces of the mission yeah we over... prioritize re- reliability so we we didn't even Got we it. just wanted okay. data right we wanted to make sure uh-huh. it worked the whole time it did not drop on someone like in like cause a fire like we wanted to make sure it would work exactly as we thought it would it, it should in the environments we planned for um and uh and video what was, was not, the payload on this thing payload was just the electronics like we no one had no one at rat had actually <laughs> done this because at the time the previous group to do it um their only successful flight was like i think like seven, 60 or seventy thousand feet and then like the balloon popped or something and everyone after that like they literally lost communications with it like part way through the line yeah so i when i hear about uh balloon launches usually it's like okay they want to see the curvature of the earth right they want to track the location with gps and hopefully transmit it back so you know where the thing's going uh temperature standard that kind of stuff like temperature pressure that wind speed whatever you can get yep but is there other were there other sensors on board as well? Light? Uh, no, nope. there was just like that one. There was just temperature, GPS, uh, battery voltage, mm-hmm. um, very Got basic. It. Yep. it okay. was just like, okay, let's see if we can do this. And mm-hmm. um, at the last minute, we put uh, a camera on it and got great photos from it. But um, we actually did things like we we didn't know about conformal coat at the time, but we mm, yeah. 
we actually took like clear nail polish and like completely coated the boards because we figured, well, condensation is going to form this board because it's going to get really cold at altitude. And then when it falls back down, um, it's going to hit the humid atmosphere of, you know, Rochester, New York summer. And then it's going to like just get <laughs> totally soaked. And in retrospect, I've been when, there. Yep, <laughs> when we opened it up, it was, it was literally, it was still on blinking being fine. And there was like globs of water on like some of the, like it, the MSP 430s, right? But it fell because through we had a sealed it. Yeah, it fell through a thunderstorm. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. yeah there's, okay. there's actual pictures of hail, like we some of the pictures of hail <laughs> in them. Um, nice. And the payload actually went up about 2,000 feet. Um, we actually confirmed it with one of the meteorologists in the area that there was a strong updraft. But the GPS log shows it going down to something like 6,000 feet, going back up over several minutes to 8,000 feet, and then coming back down. And like, I mm. think to this day, I've never heard of anyone doing that, but it was just total luck. Um, but it survived. And when we were showing this to uh, SpaceX recruiters uh, when they came to RIT, they just basically latched on and realized a lot of that forward thinking, oh, what like conformal coding boards, designing for reliability and like knowing what your requirements were. Like pictures are nice to have, but it must work. Um, and that essentially got us into <laughs> SpaceX. Um, I'm going to say SpaceX does <laughs> care about the pictures, though. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The marketing arm is strong. The marketing with arm is very strong. <laughs> so right after school then, uh, well, you did an internship and then out to SpaceX? Yeah. Yep. That was it. Yeah, we, we interned and then went went full-time right after we graduated. Awesome. What was the era that you joined in? So I'm my history is not great. Uh, um, we interned but... at the end of 20, 2011 and then um, uh-huh. came back for full-time uh, in mid 2013 and then so what is like but what was so c2 so c2 plus the first space station mission um was uh it launched sorry you have to break those out sorry c2 is c2 (laughs) is the first dragon mission that actually birthed with the international space station it was the first one okay uh prior to this spacex was not taken seriously at all Right. Like it was kind of okay. like people were writing like like really bad articles about SpaceX being like, oh, they don't know what they're doing. And um, uh-huh. so a, a week after we our internship ended, um, they actually launched and, and, and went to the space station. And then that's really when SpaceX started kind of like taking off me and taken seriously, um, mm-hmm. because like you don't just connect to the space station. Like that's a pretty monumental uh, <laughs> task. Yeah. And, well, yeah. Uh, if you if you mess that up, you kind of bring the whole the whole kit yeah. caboodle down huh yeah and then to give like yeah exactly it's, it's humanity like humanity's most expensive vehicle so like like yeah. I, I vividly remember people like being like i don't want to be the world's first company to bump the space station <laughs> you know <laughs> like like people were terrified yeah. so um so like yeah, yeah you I take mean, that yeah. seriously that risk is serious um so like also to give like yeah. a size perspective um spacex was about a thousand people when we joined which is a big company okay. but it's like sure. six five six thousand people now so right and also compared to NASA too. Yeah. You know, like yeah. and all the contractors and like just generally space companies have a lot of people, right? There's a lot of manufacturing, there's a lot yeah. of testing, there's a lot of yeah. engineering. There's a lot more manufacturing uh there's a lot personnel of, there's a lot of lawyers for when yep. they bump into the uh the space station. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you gotta be careful about that stuff. You know? <laughs> so what uh so what was it like? I mean we've I, you know obviously me and Dave have talked about SpaceX a yeah. lot on the show. Um without any reference point obviously you know I, i've been i got a tour from you know you guys uh so that was nice i appreciated that uh, <laughs> no problem <laughs> yeah and uh you know that uh but otherwise yeah I don't, I don't really have a feeling for what it was like i think brent can agree that um it was quite a wild ride um you have a lot of responsibility uh early on or at least you did back then it, it has definitely turned into a bigger company um whether mm-hmm. or not it likes to admit that um but it is definitely um changed but when we first started like you know, I was 22, 23. And I, I literally remember being in like meetings and people were like, do we delay launch? Like your choice. Like, it, you know, I mean, it, it, it still would have elevated to some higher levels, but like, sure. it was like, there was some pretty intense things where you're like, you're looking at risks and, and, and engineering and you're like, wow. Okay. Like, um, you know, I think, um, Brent can also attest to like some of the stuff we worked on, but like, you know, uh, you look at other companies in a bigger aerospace and it could be a decade before the hardware gets in, in orbit or, you know, you might have to be, you know, a, a certain seniority to even work on flight harder. Like, like circuit yeah, board with my right. name on it, my design, you know, deployed satellites when I was 24, like. Yeah, it's pretty trippy. Pretty trippy. Pretty trippy. <laughs> um, I, I remember yeah. like that that particular launch. So any of the Orbcom or Radium launches use my one of some of my boards, and because um, for the extra payload capacity. So like the one that launched this morning used my board, and um, and uh, um, you know I remember like that pretty first cool. one when like when when it got to orbit, like everyone's cheering, and I'm like I'm like 
I'm like white. I'm just like pale. I'm just like, <laughs> my job's not over, guys. Like, guys, <laughs> guys. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. Oh, God. Oh, crap. Oh, God. Oh, crap. Um, yeah. yeah. And it obviously it's worked every time, which has been amazing. But like, it, like the, mm-hmm. you know, the stress is real and it teaches you real fast. And I mean, Brent has some crazy experiences too uh, on that end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess I, I can just, I, I talk a little bit about that, which is um, probably the, the, the craziest, probably the, one of the craziest days of my life thus far um, was, was, uh, was my, I, I can't go into the details of it, but the, the part that I, did I, did I designed for F921, which was a upgraded, a much upgraded version of a prior design. Um, yeah. That's the booster and, outside. It's literally the booster. That's the monument. Yeah. It was the first, um, the booster, the, the, the rocket. Yep. Yeah. The rocket that's like outside SpaceX, like as a big monument. Like that's oh, it's wow. that one. That's okay. that's the one. That's wow. F nine twenty one. Yeah. So so um okay. my my development for that 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 was like the first time that uh, I got the chance to to really to really just uh, uh, own this this really enti- this entire this entire um, critical component that had uh, mission success tied to it. it had um uh, you know even a secondary mission of landing. Like you know I, I remember going through um, um these designs and I actually messed up part of the design. Um, and, and I had to redo it real quick and, uh, and what, bring it through all of the qualification testing, vibration, thermal, uh, shock, uh, electromagnetic interference, um, testing. And, and, and we had some issues with, with some parts of it and, and realizing, okay, well, like, what's the failure mode of this, like going through this and I, it, we, it caused me to go and for, you know, it was like a nine months uh, of just pretty head down work. Um, and quantifying different parts of the vehicle and like how this, how this risk plays into, to what the vehicle would do, which was like, Hey, if this actually happens, um, and there's a non-zero chance it could like the rocket will just tip over when it's coming back in the atmosphere. And I'll be the reason oh my God, that, okay. it, that it's not, yeah. that it, it, that it breaks up. So like, you know, really, right, really right. did it, did it, did a really good like effort to not be that person. And, um, uh, yeah, it, in, in the end, it was this crazy roller coaster where on launch day had this really weird feeling of like, it, it, it's ready. I feel confident, but like, oh man, like this is this is a lot, and it's just this feeling yeah. of um of like when that when that ten second countdown w- w- was coming. It's like one of the most nervous things I've ever felt in my life. Um, and then once it once the tie downs let when, go, I had this once amazing. It once it starts moving, yeah. I had this amazing relief of like euphoria of like there's no turning back. I, there's nothing I can do. Whatever I've done <laughs> right. is done. And then like right. five seconds right. after, I'm like. Oh no, we're not done yet. I could blow it up. <laughs> like it's like this weird roller coaster, and yeah. um, so it was, it was very nerve wracking. And then on, on the way back down, like it was hitting air currents, and I was just like, "Oh, is it tipping? Is it tipping?" And um, yeah. um, and then and then it landed, and it was just uh, it was one of the times when I I really got the feeling that engineering could be this amazingly amazing journey of hardship and. And just success and 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 learning and I learned so much from that and nerves and nerves, and nerves. <laughs> it's just like it's like it, worrying yeah right. so so like you know and I don't I don't you know like I, I made some mistakes I probably shouldn't have ma- have made on that and but fixed them and flew hundreds after that hundreds of them have flown since yeah. so like I am confident that we that we that we fixed it uh, it was one of the first times I, I I got the chance to really experience engineering as as this lifestyle, um, which <laughs> as an yeah. action sport, huh? <laughs> yeah, as an action sport. sport. It, that's yeah, a really good yeah. way of saying it. Now, now aerospace, the, the, I mean, yeah. new space is kind of like that. It's kind of an action sport. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, watching, watching you guys go crazy. Like when, when the, you know, oh the my. feed turns, oh my. all the people going nuts when the pl- landing happens or where the deployment happens. That, it's great. You bring up a great point. Like one of the, I, this is probably also its own action sport was, um, watching conspiracy videos about SpaceX as an employee. <laughs> <laughs> so first off, like, Every now, everyone oh, who does need it, some links. Yeah, uh, <laughs> like first off, everyone who does that, like the first mistake you make is not using like incognito mode. So then YouTube for like the next four months gives you conspiracy videos. Um, <laughs> yeah, that happened to and me. Then, <laughs> totally yeah. That. And then like yeah. secondly, it's oh, like man. you're you're watching this and like you you see this like person who's just like, oh, these are paid actors, like such shills, like like this is all obviously staged. And it's like, dude, I'm actually really crying, like. You're re- like, I'm yeah. literally crying on that video. Like, stop, <laughs> you yeah. know, like that right, was a lot right. of work. I, I lost like, you know, lost, but like I worked for like a year and a half on that thing. Like we're not right. actors. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, people, people are a-holes no matter oh, what yeah, you do, yeah. you know? So <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, but, uh... I, I guess to follow it up is like, uh, um, you can have all these, these, you know, crazy, crazy experiences. <laughs> the important part um, is that in order for them to be sustainable, you have to sort of not do that 100% of the time. 
Uh, so, yeah. you know, it, it, you know, you sort of have these crazy experiences and then it, then it gets for a couple months, it gets sort of like standard and normal. And then you might have a different mission or, or some, some other big upgrade and then it gets intense again and you sort of go in this roller coaster. Um, and, and that's how mm-hmm. you can sustain for, for years doing that. If you just go all in and you're, you're, you're that person working, you know, 16 hours a day, every day, you're, you're going to last a year or two and then you're going to burn out. Yeah, like, yeah, that's actually one yep, of the things yep. that when you see a lot of people like on Reddit or something, or, or SpaceX, which, you know, it's a, it's a great subreddit, but like people are like, oh my, you know, they've obviously never worked there. And like, oh yeah, like they pull like 14, 15, 16 hour days every day. They'll work weekends. It's like, yes, people do that. And then they leave after a year or two years. They just get completely burnt yeah, out. Right. Like it's not yep. sustainable. Um, so uh, yeah, it's interesting to see how that It does seem, is. so the, the thing I've heard is that it's very mission driven though, in general. It's And it sounds like it's just because space nerds you know like, yeah i mean course now mission the mission driven. now every mission you know now a mission is like you know every couple of weeks so <laughs> right so like right it, well they, yeah. yeah and that changes things too right yeah yeah it's, it's awesome it's like flying is routine now it's you know it's yeah it, I, it, it's it was interesting to watch the amount of people that would come in for for to, to watch you know a live launch you know yeah uh you know four years ago like you know it seems like half the company would 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 would, would turn up at four in the morning and now it's uh you know on right. a weekend and uh and you know now it's like oh well yeah we're, you know we're gonna launch we get this down um the um and then you you know like the online online youtube video washer um oh, yeah. people, you know you can see the counter there and, and it and it's and it's you know it's it's i guess it's kind of like the space show it's like um um yeah exact same thing yeah, happened yeah. right exactly it's not like the landing on the moon right it's like the in the however many missions of the the shuttle you know in the 70s and 80s it's just like yeah it's just another thing we yep. gotta gotta haul that crap up for that really expensive vehicle right <laughs> yeah <Yep. laughs> but, you know it, it's amazing though because like once 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 you achieve that as like a society then you can go to the next problem okay like 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 that was fucking right. heavy and and you know and in crew dragon and uh and bfr and then you know on the other side of things mm-hmm. like we're, you know you're seeing um i mean Rockets are autonomous vehicles, and now autonomy is becoming, you know, into cars and airplanes and everything else. So uh, now you can see, like, okay, people have figured out how, how to do the control systems of this and do the engineering to survive the dynamic environments and and telecommunications. And okay, that's a solved problem. Move to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, focus yep. your resources yep. on something else. So what? Uh, so I mean, I know you guys aren't allowed to talk about necessarily all the specific things you did, but could you give us a feel for kind of the overview of, you know? You both worked on avionics and testing and all that stuff, but like, what what kind of electronics are even involved? Yeah, right? so um, I guess I'll, I'll start with that. So we were both on what's called what was called like the the Rio team. So um, like anything basically analog mixed signal design or computing. So um, mm-hmm. uh, everything from like flight computers, uh, where our team the cameras um, on the vehicle uh, that you see like those downlink cameras that was someone on our team. Um, Mm-hmm. Uh, flying the fairing back and it's not use and it's not using off the shelf either it's, um, it's i mean you can't all, go too far into custom. that um mm-hmm. uh if you start looking into space rated components things get real expensive real fast and yeah, one of the yeah. interesting things to note on that is um back in the apollo era um uh, integrated circuits and electronics were so new and they were just unreliable so you had to do something mm-hmm. like hand picking you know, parts and like, you know, basically, you know, doing this, what is the space rated components uh, methodology mm-hmm. so you could get the reliability you needed. Now, it, it, the like the, well, back then, it, aerospace was like most of the market. Now, aerospace is like almost like non-existent. Like most of the integrated circuit and like electronics market is dominated by consumer. And then when you think about it, okay, if a consumer part, like let's say, I don't know, like Apple's I chip, thought. right? One of Apple's chips. If that has like a failure rate that is like, any sizable like percentage right and you know like they're built they're building i don't know i'm going to take a guess and say something like 35 million phones a month right like right you don't right, want to right. throw out five million phones that's a lot of money so like um right. so it's so actually you're saying the engineering levels are similar and, and that kind of yeah thing. so like commercial technology is is has actually been forced to become become so reliable um that right. there are now i don't i can't necessarily back this up or at least publicly but like there's you know, one can argue like, okay, well, if the reliability is so bad for consumer parts, how, to, how does a company like, you know, Apple or someone stay in business, like you, they would be having mm-hmm. stuff fail left and right. So um, it's right. actually, since the space race um, drastically improved such that commercial components um, 
can can be used and very reliably. Right. Well, we've talked to uh, Sean from uh, who was at Planet, and Planet was kind of based on that as well. They were obviously they had a limited scope, and I don't know if they've changed since, but they always said like their satellites were like meant to be limited scope, anyways. But even still, it seemed like a lot of the stuff that was going out there, it was you know it was ready to ready to go, even even though it was you know wasn't rated for five plus years missions. Yeah. Well, you you know like there's. Um, the, the qualification of, of components for aerospace, whether it's a plane or a rocket, um, is is where is where like there's confidence that's gained into into the design and mm-hmm. into the components. Um, yeah. And and really, if you if you if you step back and go, okay, well, if I buy a space rated component that just has a lot of testing and analysis on it, I, I'm still probably going to qualify the end design I soldered together on a board and sure. and put in. Um, and and if 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 an iPhone, you know, if, if like like imagine if like if iPhones had like a five percent failure rate, making thirty five million phones a year. Like that's a lot of phones right. that you just scrap. It's, it's right. gone. And um, so okay, so this technology has become really good. And then you just merge it together and say, okay, well, like like it, and, and I'm not saying that you know that SpaceX or any other aerospace companies just just go buy off like DigiKey or something. Like like um, that's you know like there's better lot controls and everything that someone should do, but. In the grand scheme of things, if you take a really reliable component, use a reliable process to in a known process to to to, to solder and assemble something together, and then put it through a, a, a like a like a testing regime to make sure that the design is 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 as robust as you can, and then also make sure the thing you're actually flying is built to the standard and rigor to 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 not break. Um, you know, mm-hmm. like that's that that's a that's a really good stance to stand on. Um. Yeah. And like you couldn't yeah. do that yeah, back I, in Apollo. Yeah, I would I would actually add to that that um there's a mill standard, so 1540 or SMC, I don't know, 16, um, that basically says, okay, there's an acceptance test and a qual test like regime that um what you're doing is you're taking electronics and you're testing them so that you make sure that they're um they're like the bathtub curb of mortality, right? You have the early failures, then yeah. you have like life, and then you have everything in the end dies at some point, right? What you're trying to do is make sure anything you install on that rocket has been like degraded enough, like just enough that it gets you past infant mortality and into that long, um, into that long, like uh, extended um, uh, lower bathtub curve, right? Of like just mm-hmm. random failures every couple thousand or million hours, right? And then Right. Um, you want to pamper those, those avionics. So you do what's called like derating, right? NASA derating. And, uh, yep. you basically pamper the electronics by design such that once you get to that lower bathtub curve of mortality, um, you've made that failure rate as long as possible before, um, uh, end of life happens. And that's like, that's right. kind of when you take that approach, um, combined with very reliable com- commercial components, you can make some very reliable, uh, space rated not space rated but like space capable uh components for you know relatively cheap like expensive by hobby standards but like sure cheap sure. by aerospace standards i'd like to add, add to that that like if you and like just take that approach that, that bryce and i just talked about and then apply that to like what amsat has done you know 20 30 years ago to now where you know they're buying largely commercial electronics and then testing the designs testing the actual built assembly and putting them up there there are amsat satellites that are still functional to most or all of their capability, um, or at least to some capability that's useful after 30 years in space orbiting, uh, you know, like, so just because something isn't space rated doesn't mean it's not good. Yep. Okay. Uh, so some of the, I, I definitely want to talk about more about the considerations of actual, you know, aer- avionics and aer- aerospace, uh, like for actually designing that stuff. But like, so, so you guys were doing, you said you were doing the, Rio, so oh, yeah. whatever that was. Let me like so. For and example, then, I, I don't want to go in. Like, what else is on a rocket, though? Yeah, I, mean, so, I guess I don't even. I don't even know what a rocket. So yeah, a rocket up, basically but. has. Um, you have some form of computing on it, right? You have a flight computer or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, now, there's many ways to you know skin a cat, and then like there are many ways to build a flight computer. Um, so like, what you really need to answer is okay. I have computing, and those run essentially GNC algorithms, so guidance, navigation, and control, uh, and also things like you know fault detection and isolation and recovery. Um, so like if something did happen, like, Hey, an engine blew out. Um, okay. Shut that engine down and adjust the rest of the rockets to compensate for that lack of thrust. Right. So, um, uh, so those are the algorithms running on the computer, but okay. That doesn't do you any good when you're just 
computing stuff. So you need to sense the environment. So you, you essentially have an analog world, right? You're sensing a pressure or a, a tilt or a, a resistance, like a temperature. Um, and then you need to compute that, what, what that all means. And then you want to actuate something like I want to gimbal the engine, you know, one degree in this direction. Okay, then that computer needs to send a signal all the way down to, say, the engine to um, to interface with its servos and, and, and hydraulics to to move uh, to, to move that engine. And uh, so along the way, you, you have various analog to digital and digital to analog conversions, um, various uh, sensors like, um, you know, pressure, mm-hmm. pressure, temperature. Um, you often have, you know, GPS uh, and inertial measurement units on a rocket. So not only do you know, like, at a high rate, like exactly in space and like where you are and what your velocity is, um, like say from a mm-hmm. GPS, uh, but you have in between those updates, you have say an IMU that is using like a gyroscope essentially to say, all right, here's a much faster and like almost, you know, not continuous, but much faster rate of like, what is, wh- what is the tip of this rocket? Right. Where is it aimed? Um, you know, what do I need to do to, to, you know, keep it from, from keep tipping over or, or aim it where I want it to go. And then you also have to do things like, um, all right, well, once I'm in orbit, I need to, to deploy the payloads. So then you, you know, actually interface with pyrotechnics or some other type of actuation, um, where you actually it's deploy called pyrotechnics. Them. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are pyrotechnics. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You can buy, satellites. you can buy like stand, they're, they're called fr- frangible bol- bolts. Like explosive bolts. And- well, like, no, well, the frangible bolts are one way to do it, but like there's yeah. NASA, Na- NASA standard initiators, which are, um, Basically, like old Cold War type satellites would use them. Basically, mm. they they they, awesome. they really kick the payload. So like people tend to not use them because they, um, you know, you get a hell right. of a kick basically from them. Which if you have to right. design for, it means your satellite's less efficient. Okay, so all right, so it sounds like, ro- I mean, so rockets. I guess I should have thought about that too. Basically, you you blowing stuff out the bottom and you're trying to go up, yeah. right? So you need to, yeah, you need to kind of just understand your flight path though and then kind of react to it. Right. That's, well, well that's I also, the main thing. I also yep. forgot to add that there's, you know, there's a whole RF t- telemetry portion of this that you have to get the telemetry okay. down. Um, yep. And if you're not trying to land or do anything like that, like you probably don't even need a receiver on the rocket. But, mm-hmm. you know, if you're actually trying to land, like, okay, well, now you have to like detect your altitude. You have to, um, you know, try to basically get to this GPS point, you know, that is say a barge or a landing pad and you have a ton of more, you know, avionics just to do that. Uh, so, yeah. okay. Um, and this is about the, the, uh, the landing portion with the, yeah. So yeah, really in the end, you're, you're trying to, in, to interface this world that is essentially continuous or analog, um, with a, a system that, that is autonomous. Like once, once a rocket lifts off the ground, you're just watching it. It is, it has a pre, like, <laughs> like there's nothing you can do other than basically blow it right. up. Um, there's really nothing you can do. Wait, is there a, is there a button for that? <laughs> um, well, there used to be. So like the old range, uh, yeah? flight oh, range. Wow. Uh, so there's a Western range and an Eastern range, uh, as they say uh-huh. for, um, basically, yeah. So traditionally rockets would have a transponder on them and a receiver that, you know, uh, once, once the signal goes away, the rocket just blew itself up. So like they would have like the U S air force or, I think it's the Air Force, um, that is like doing this. And once it gets to a point where even if it did fail, it wouldn't impact, it could not at all impact, you know, human lives, um, they would, you know, would save it, right? So it couldn't blow up. But like the idea is that if a rocket starts going off course or anything, um, you want to disperse all that energy as quickly as possible so that it doesn't hit as one big mm-hmm. piece. Um, yeah, lots yeah. of little pieces. <laughs> lots of little pieces. Yeah, and and, and yeah. Okay. Yeah. speaking in, in like generalities, this, I mean, this is yeah, this is true for like sure. all rockets. Like, you know, you know, all the stuff he just yeah, went over okay, is like okay. is like most of the modern rockets that have launched in the last thirty years. There is a new thing for. Um, I mean, SpaceX is currently flying, and, and I know that's public that it's autonomous. So it actually doesn't use that system. Um, but even NASA is putting out, uh, I believe it's called CAS or there's like a, I don't know, an open source, but it's like NASA has its own version of an autonomous, um, like flight safety system. So, um, oh, cool. so like okay. that is starting to become a thing, uh, with rockets and it, what it does is it reduces a lot of the burden on, uh, essentially the government, which they charge you for, which is a, it's a huge expense, uh, for a rocket launch. And if you're doing something, what SpaceX doing, launching a rock a lot, then, you, that is something that is very enticing to you know, reduce the cost of 
you know, because you're basically mm-hmm. paying a ton of people to sit around and, you know, watch and make sure the thing's on course. Right. And if you think about it, like like Space Race 3.0, 3.0 is, is on, you know, like Rocket Lab and, and, and all those other people. And like, you know, it, it, it just makes sense. It's a modern 21st century that, you know, these rockets are becoming autonomous. Um, computing is getting smaller and faster, better. And, you know, like, like, like the range system, you know, like what these rockets already know where they are and what they're doing and you can make them reliable they can make that decision themselves. You know, you yeah. know, we, we trust autonomous cars to, to drive down the highway. Uh, well, I don't think that's actually true. Yet, <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> Depends who you're talking to. It's, it's vacillated back and forth, but ho- <laughs> some, hopefully some, we'll some get to back do, to that right? point. We'll, we'll, Brett, we'll edit yeah, that right. part out, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. right. No, no, no. Uh, well, that's interesting, though, because you were talking about like kind of knowing where it is. And so I kind of want to get back to the, the considerations for the, you know, the, the aeronautical electronics, I guess. How much is like the... like you talked about the testing and, and getting into the bathtub curve, uh, getting, you know, into the, the low failure point, but like, what about the roles of like redundancy and self-check and all mm-hmm. that? I mean, like, is that, is that still a key piece of design? Like, do you, are you designing a triplicate checked, uh, temperature sensor? We have to be what? really careful here. Cause, um, mm-hmm. you can figure this stuff. If actually it's funny, like doing what I'm doing now, I'm at a small startup, but like doing rockets, but like, like if you looked at LinkedIn, you can actually figure a lot of this out just by what people put on their, their profiles, which is actually really funny. Mm-hmm. Um, you can piece it together. But um, yeah, so redundancy can play a big part in rocketry. It depends mm-hmm. on what you want. So um, uh, that you, certainly some companies will triplicate their system. Um, mm-hmm. And that is a thing you can do. I, there are some companies. Even I not- just always remember talking about like so in the industrial cons- control space, at least, which I used to work in. Mm-hmm. They talk. They reference space, and they'd be like talking about lockstep. Yes, and that was like it, like it, uh, instruction by instruction. <clears throat> right. You know, lockstep. You like do all three processors agree? That's that's basically what I think yeah. about. This is an so. area we we can't necessarily dive into deep. That is likely very proprietary okay. uh, in SpaceX, uh, but. Uh, so lockstep is a general term that 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 NASA does use, and they, they talk a lot about it if you find their their literature. Um, mm-hmm. I've seen a lot of lockstep used in a dual redundant system where you have um, like two processors essentially checking each other. In the second that yeah. like, one disagrees, right. you go to like a cold like the the cold side of of the like there's a hot and a cold. Like one is just waiting there to go, and the other one is actively controlling the rocket. Um, if you're mm-hmm. that is not necessarily voting. Um, for, you know, uh, from like a triplicated side by that, uh, for like a triplicated standpoint, um, if you have something that's triple modular redundant, you have an A, B and C string, right? So that's, if you generalize that, you're, you're basically saying, I'm going to pick what two agree. Um, you know, if, if, if any two agree, I'm doing that, or that is true. Um, and that is, it, yeah. and that is, so lockstep isn't really voting in that sense where it will switch over very quickly to say the other system waiting to go as a backup but if something's wrong in that system then you're, you're done whereas with voting uh, if like two out of three agree then um you don't even notice the failure like if, if say a sensor fails like like the system like the everything will just keep working it, it flies through it um if say mm-hmm. your actuator fails like if something like one of your your motor controllers or something that is say triplicated uh fails then the motor doesn't even do anything weird, right? You know from telemetry mm-hmm. that it's failed, yeah. but like there's no outward appearance of a failure. So when you're doing something like a, a rocket launch, um, you, milliseconds can can kill you, right? So like mm-hmm. you don't have time to say, oh, go into safe mode. There's no real like safe mode, <laughs> right, right? right? Whereas if you're in a satellite, like lockstep, there's and, no blue screen of death. Right. There's just death. When like like look at like, curi- <laughs> like look at curiosity, right? Like curiosity every now and then right. goes into a like a safe state. Oh, like I'm going in a very safe mode. And then people right, spend a couple right. days and they figure out, okay, what happened and how do we fix it? Um, uh-huh. By that time, Falcon 9 or whatever rocket would be in the bottom of the ocean, right? Like you can't do that. Right. So, um, you often you're not you're not talking <laughs> ill of curiosity though i i know, oh, no, I know no, you wouldn't I mean, do that no i never no curiosity is amazing i mean i remember it was funny because that landed on mars my homie. <laughs> yeah. that landed on mars um right after both of us finished our internships at spacex and it was oh, like nice. it was pretty cool yeah. to watch that and be like okay i've actually worked on space stuff now that's insane yep. <laughs> right exactly exactly yeah, and I think that 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 always is what I think about when I think of like autonomous too. Like all of the different like situations that could have happened. You know, they shot that rocket what two three years prior, 
I think like or eight months more prior, or something a little bit quicker. Was it? Yeah. Okay, I didn't remember how long it traveled, but it's like basically they, there was no control there. You couldn't do anything. So you're just sitting and watching. And even the, the transmitting back, you didn't know until a couple minutes later that what had happened. I remember the feed was yeah. delayed just because of Yeah, distance, it was like 20-minute so. delay or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Right, and so it's like, okay, well, you know, hope hope everything goes well. <laughs> That's like pure autonomous, right? Yeah. Space yeah. is big. <laughs> yeah, space is very big. You get that one jokester in the background who, just to play a prank, like pops the champagne 20 minutes before, like, before the telemetry pops in, right? Just be like, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. that's great. <laughs> so what about other, I mean, are there other th- lessons that you've learned from designing for space that you think are applicable to our listeners right now of like, like things that they should be, you know, airing towards or like implementing in terrestrial designs? <laughs> um, sure, I, 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 can, I can add some, some to that there. there like w- one of the things that I, I've, so... One of the things I'm grateful to have learned in my experience thus far in my engineering career in aerospace in general, um, whether that was on rockets or airplanes, um, has been uh, there's something to be said about designing a circuit to work and to work right. Um, there's another mm-hmm. thing to, to, to understand that circuitry or that system so much that you know every way it's going to fail. And you've protected or mm. mitigated everyone that's going to fail. Yeah. And in my in my prior life, I would spend probably twenty percent of my entire effort designing the circuit to work, and then the next year of my life destroying it in every other way, and then making it not get destroyed <laughs> in that way, so that when and when it went into into under mission, whether it's in space or in the air, that it. Um, I knew it was going to work, and if it didn't work, I knew how it wasn't going to work, and we've already put safeguards in to you know to to fail over to a, a, a you know a safe or redundant um, design or, or or to not allow that failure to occur. You know, like putting the protection in, mm-hmm. um, and, and that's yeah. really made me change the way I that I that I design circuits or systems. Um, you know, always looking for the ways so it's like going to really, break. Really paranoid now. Really paranoid. Like, <laughs> all the ways this yep. is going to break. Uh, because making it work is, is is only the start of it. Yeah, so, making it work every time is really hard. Over manufacturing, over faults, over everything. But what are, what are some of the? I, I, you can make up an example if you need to. But like, give give us an example mm. of that. Like twenty percent design, eighty yeah. percent make it fail, and then the fail over to something. Let's see. I, I, can, I have a good I example. Temperature sensor. Can we can we use can we use a temperature exemper- sensor as an example? Right. So, uh, it's a. IR based temperature sensor, not that you would ever use that in a space situation, but so you know that the you power rails and your I squared C and stuff like that. Is is this a good example? I don't even know. Let you know let, let, um yeah, we can we can we can go with that. Um uh, I think maybe a better example might be like like a switching power supply. Might be sure. might be a really Perfect. good one. Okay. Because yep. uh it has a lot yep. of different avenues to that I think most most people would would, would would have been familiar with. It's like you you know, you have your standard buck converter, um, voltage in voltage out um and you, and you can get it to work you know 12 volts in five volts out but now you gotta start thinking about okay um what what's what's the reliability of all of these components that's step one you know um what's their margins mm-hmm. you know things like like capacitors you know if you're going to be going into space you or, or just aerospace in general you want something that's going to last long the f- rule number one don't use electrolytic capacitors because they have a limited <laughs> lifetime, they it's leak. True. It's they true. leak. You know, yeah, they yeah. can't survive in the vacuum. And even even if you're in an airplane, you go up, you know, thirty forty thousand feet or more. Um, right. You're basically it dries out. And yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. so so okay, you're going to use. You know, maybe you, you're likely going to end up using something like ceramic. You know, how many people, especially like younger engineers, know that ceramic capacitors change their capacitance based on the voltage applied to them. I'm not a young engineer, but I knew that. Yeah. Right? So, but, like, <laughs> but I've never had to deal with it, right? That, that's probably the main thing is that even though I've, you know, I've read about it, it's like, oh yeah, this is a thing that happens in extreme exi- yeah. conditions, but it's like, oh no, no, this is an extreme condition. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but so the crazy like, part is the, the circuit could work perfectly with that uh-huh. error in it. And then in orbit, something happens, right? Or like manufacturing, you know, issue happens. And then it's not just like, oh, this one unit died. It's like, all right, that basically took down the satellite or it took down a whole string of the satellite so like like those are like basically the things you worry about the the hidden the stuff mm. you don't know is on the edge yeah so so continuing with with that um so okay so sizing all your components and uh to have good margins that's called derating you can look up derating like nasa derating online and get, get a bunch of stuff um mm-hmm. and that's basically just give yourself enough headroom so that you're not stressing right. the component, you know, you might give yourself right. overspect the crap out exactly. of it. You're saying, Ex- but exactly. you know, within exactly. within limits, exactly. yeah, right. Um, 
And then you're going to look and go, okay, well, um, if I put the switching converter together, I can just trust that the data sheet says, you know, to put this thing together with this, these values, the components is going to be stable. But how, how stable do you know it's going to be? If you're going into space or like some in hostile environment that changes temperature drastically, um, you know, like orbiting does, uh, you could go through some pretty extreme temperature ranges. How do you know that your phase and gain on your switching converter is really stable? Especially mm -hmm. like, like, yeah. expect, you know, do you go into an unstable region if you hit all of your tolerance specs randomly because you bought another lot of parts and like you randomly got this tolerance right. stack up and then on top of that, you the temperature swung to like negative 60 degrees C and suddenly all of this happened and your entire satellite dies. So like, like you can't do that. Yeah. So, so you have to like, well, you know, it's, it's the, and I'll, I'm going to add the dangerous part of that is these are like the problems Brent's talking about. These aren't random failures. Like this is a design, like if this is a design error. So even if you have three strings, like redundancy, mm -hmm. if it's a right. design error, all three yeah. will fail. Yeah, exactly. Right. So right. like, these are the things that keep you up at night. So, so yeah. So, so, you know, you work yourself through that and then, then you start looking at, um, you know, your, your. Uh, like in your inductor, you know, you know, okay, I, I get it. Uh, you know, your equivalent series resistance in your inductor is just spinning heat. Uh, what, what, what about your your core saturation in, in all these different in parameters? How much heat are you generating on this inductor? Is it within bounds? Um, then you start looking. Okay, well, transients. What's my what's how, what, what's my output output um, bandwidth need to be to handle the downstream switching loads? And not go unstable or, or or cause a voltage sag. My upstream, like if I'm if I, if I have lightning hit the area or like someone someone that, that's handling the electronics isn't wearing an ESC strap and zaps the the device, uh, there's going to be a huge surge current that comes in to the input and bl blow out the you know the the um the switching converter mm -hmm. electronics. So you have to protect against that with you know maybe TVS diodes or um or, or, or other other devices. Now you put this thing on on, on in, in service and you're in an environment where you have transmitters and other computers and the, the power bus has hundreds of different computing and like you know um uh, uh just actuators and and motors on, on on top of it. So like it's really noisy. Now you get to think about well how does EMI play into this? I get a, how much do I really need to filter? If you add, if you just filter everything, you have a really big design. It's heavy, and you know, heavy big designs probably can't survive. Ah. Probably can't survive high vibrations. Five so and shock. It, it's five yeah. and shock. So like you have to yeah. thread this needle. Like you have to really remember, understand these things are like strapped to a Merlin engine, right? <laughs> like right. Just, like exactly. they're, yeah. they're, they're built tough, right? And I'm guessing that you mentioned the weight too. So I, I'm guessing that you're given a. You're like, well, you've got 100 grams to work with, or 250 I, grams. I, to work I don't with, think right? you can go like, like into that that that's design type, but like it's, I, I just meant. But there are there are constraints around weight. That's all. Yeah, really yeah, there are constraints. No one will complain about it being lighter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. But you know, perfect. that's like rule number one in space. A really yeah. interesting thing okay. to do is like going to Huntsville, Alabama, and and uh, and walking under the Saturn V and just looking up and, and like seeing how they design their electronics is fascinating. Like the like mm. the, the yeah. magnetic core yeah. uh, memory, and just thinking thinking mm -hmm. okay, like like these these aren't tiny integrated circuit. These are these are like wire. These are like wired Chunks. together. You know, <laughs> electronics and and yeah. and early semiconductors um, and cores of metal and like. And, and ferret material and they had to survive all of these same environments the high temperatures the high the high vibrations and shock um and they had to think about all of this so when you're putting it in your design like generally if you think about okay well like why why can't we just use an iphone to fly yeah. an airplane or to like 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 launch a rocket it's like well like you have all this high current and you have all of these these um these different functionalities it's, all of, and all of that has to happen within this crazy environment. And generally, smaller size means more fragile. Not always, but generally. And and like you have to you have to thread this needle of um, when you're designing for aerospace in general, you have to thread this needle of 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 performance versus reliability. And if you go in in either yeah. direction, if you go overly performance, you're probably going to be pretty sporty and maybe not survive and, or like have a failure rate that's, that's, that's unacceptable. And if you go in the other direction to be overly reliable, you'll either never build <laughs> the thing you're trying to build because you'll just keep iterating and making it be from yeah. here. It'll be so heavy. You can't fly it. Um, yeah. Or you can't fit it inside whatever you're trying to build. Sure. Yeah. That's yeah. another good constraint. Right. I'll, of course. I'll give an, I'll give a really, really, this is like a much quicker like example, just to, like from a sensing aspect. Um, uh, of like designing for aerospace that's like not actually I've never really seen it elsewhere um, and it's something to remind remind remember is if you, if you have like a requirement to hit a certain uh, like performance like okay you must sense this temperature or pressure to this mm -hmm. accuracy like first sure. off yep. like um, 
one of the I'm going to use some round numbers here. So they are actually wrong, but they're in the close range because I, I just want to make sure I don't give away anything. But um, like there's a mill, some mill standards that essentially say, all right, to put if you want to follow the standard, you need to subject your circuit to a negative 30 to plus 80 degrees Celsius 14 times just to get it on the rocket. Up, down, up, down, up, down, and then vibrate it. 14 right? times in a certain amount of time or just yeah, just yeah 14 times basically um, this you you as go pretty quickly t- between each extreme. Okay. Wait there just sure. enough yep. to let everything kind of even out and then test yep. it and then bring and it back, back down. down to the other temperature, right? Ooh, and you do that 14 yeah. times. Yeah, um, a little, little bit of uh, shrinking and expanding, huh? Yep, a little bit, and then <laughs> and then like and then you do a bunch of vibe, or you actually probably did a bunch of vibe before that, and then shock, or well maybe not shock from that, but like you do a bunch of this testing, right? So like so like when you say, oh yeah, I need to like measure uh, a temperature to this degree accuracy, it's like over that temperature range. It's like oh okay, yeah. <laughs> whoops, right? Um, this is right, not like a right. plus minus that five changes a lot. Grade. Right, yeah. you don't get to dis, you don't get to uh, derate the the spec either, right? You're saying. You right, one percent or whatever it needs to be over that entire right. range yes, with all over these the range. Right, and, wow. and then on top of that, um, let's say you're you're, you're measuring. Um, I'll just say like a pressure, right? You have a pressure sensor, you're measuring it. Um, let's say you you are you have a certain card that has like I don't know ten sensors on it, right? You don't generally want a failure of one sensor to propagate, right? So like, let's say I have a big, all these harness bundles going out all over the vehicle and something explodes, right? And cuts into the harness. It's a legit failure um, that you have to like account for. So suddenly the 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 battery bus, all right, we'll, we'll put it at a uh, standard, you know, the aerospace uh, or uh, one of the mill standards is, is 28 volts, right? Now you have 28 volts like going into your sensor. It's just short circuiting right into your sensor, right? If you're like nice. a lot of times you would build a, a project like this, it will probably propagate to the rest of the board and blow the whole board out, right? But like you need to actually protect that, make sure that that only affects that one sensor. None of the others, yep. none of the others even change accuracy, right? Like you need to make sure that like right. So like ground currents underneath that yes, other sensor ground currents. Can't you need to impact. like test this like crazy yeah, because wow. um like think about it. If you're doing fault tolerance and you're actually like uh, or you're just at least trying to um, sense things over the vehicle. Uh, in a very accurate manner, if one sensor gets shorted and the rest of them are all out of their accuracy range, you really can't complete the mission anymore. You you won't land the rocket. You won't like get to the right orbit. So um, these are the types of thoughts you have to put in there. And like um, you o- and then you also have this competing thing with trying to keep them simple because as you know, you can get a very large board very quick. And uh, when you start trying to protect all these, so like you have to like uh, mitigate things in very sometimes clever ways, or at least know what are my requirements I'm trying to mitigate. Um, and then one of the fun aspects that that I got to do, which is, you know, indicative of using, say, commercial parts, where if I was using a space rated, you know, set of components, you know, a board might, you know, a certain like a circuit board, right, like just might cost a couple hundred thousand dollars, one board, right, of space rated components. Um, so you're not going to really want to go and break those. Like there are stories from the old days where like NASA or whatever would like desolder like Rev 1 and put them on Rev 2, right? Just because they're so expensive. And yeah. um, when you have a commercial part, like I, I literally remember getting like five or six of my boards and spending two days and just destroying them, like like shoving like shoving, you know, battery voltage into every IO pin. It's like, okay, like how does this thing die? And then every now and then it'd be like, oh, that actually caused something to pop that should not have happened. You go in, investigate it and go, okay, I know how to fix that. And then you protect against it. And therefore like, like that's like one of the benefits of using commercial parts is you can go in and very, oh, I see. Okay. right. Right. You yeah. can go in and you can say, all right, like, cool. I'm going to go in and like destroy all this stuff because that's going to teach me what's, what does this actually do when it fails? I don't just theorize it. I then test it. Right. It's not, it's not whiteboard based. It's not even right. simulation based, which is, well, I mean, right. hell, the, the, simulation based the, uh, a lot the early in, space in, guys yeah. didn't get to do that either. <laughs> I mean, right? I mean, but, I mean uh, it, damn. And any, anyone today should be simulating their circuits if they can. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. Uh, I'll T-Spice all the way. <laughs> right. It's, cheap, it's cheaper than buying commercial parts, yeah. you know, and it's less smoke. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, it just comes down to, to like crossing your T's and dotting your I's. And, and, and it's fun because, um, you know, I... Uh, you'll end up working if you just build something for aerospace, even if you're building a CubeSat, like for, you know, a, a university, if you really want to do a good job on it, like you're going to be doing the same processes and, um, and design traits and sitting there and you're going to learn so much about a D like my DC to DC converter, um, endeavor. You're going to learn so much about DC to DC converters and about phase and gain analysis and like how they die and all the reliabilities and like, um, transients and and um 
And, and then when you go into the testing regimes and put these things through temperature and vibrations and shocks, um, you know, you're going to find out so much about all the components and like the, the, the topologies of DC DC converters. Um, like just randomly that popped in my head, like, like, you know, crystal oscillators controlling computers. Uh, if you, if you hit them hard enough vibration wise, they'll change frequency. So like, like, hmm. like just a blip, um, like, like some of them, like, especially yeah. like, like, um, especially, you know, some of the more newer ones and I, I, I don't want to go too far into it, but like, you have to be real careful because if you, if you use that in like an airplane and, and that part, and that part is shaking really violently in, in turbulence, um, I mean, it's be pretty, pretty, pretty violent, but like you can do it. You you can see jitter on, um, either frequency change or, 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 or just jitter, uh, on like a clock and, uh, and, and you can see it. Yeah. You got to account for it and you got to at least, yeah, understand what yeah, that's yeah. going to do to your and system. And then always just go back and ask like, okay, why is that requirement there? Or do I really need to protect against this? Is this a, is this a valid fault case in the, in this mission? Like, and, uh, because if you don't ask that, you're just going to, you're just going to continue adding more and more, more bulk. So like it was a fine line of, of, of engineering. Mm. Well, I think we could talk about space stuff probably all day. <laughs> uh, it sounds like you kind of both do that. Uh, <laughs> but I do want to get to the uh, the Faraday stuff too, because this is, uh, you know, it sounds like, you know, some, obviously some of these skills are transferable. And so I'm curious how that actually kind of plays out as you go into making these, uh, you know, Faraday Faraday RF boards and, and uh, you know, making commercial electronics effectively, even though it's open source and it's open source sof- software, hardware, everything else. So how kind of how it kind of impacts that side of your role? Yeah, I, so I, I'm going to start by basically saying that like um, um, it's been a pretty amazing journey, like doing Faraday RF and like those, those you know many people who actually bought some boards and you know helped us with the open source software. Um, uh, so that's like it's that's actually like been a really cool process. Um, since Brent and I left SpaceX and joined two startups. Um, it basically takes all of our time. <laughs> um, and then on right. top of that, so it's kind of on the back yeah, burner, it's right, kind of now, the back yeah. burner right now. Um, definitely yeah. something like I literally will think about it probably once a day <laughs> easily, like just like, Oh, okay. Like, you know, it gives you some time to like step back and think about like, what's the path I want to take on it. So, um, but in general, um, like getting back to, to actually Faraday and how it is currently designed. Um, it's funny because like we often joke, it's, it's somewhat, reflexive of like how I would do stuff at SpaceX in, 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 in a, in a very abstract way. Um, but like, if you notice, there's no electrolytics on it, right? Like it's all like, I just don't, I don't, it's funny. I just don't trust electrolytics. Um, no, who, who does, <laughs> who does? but like, um, but like audio, uh, audio amps people right now are like, we do, no, we love bulk <laughs> put it all on there. Um, they hate it too, but they oh just, God, they just that, need a lot of capacity. By the way, that is know? like aerospace design. Like, or that was like, and whenever I would design a DC to DC converter at, at, at SpaceX and you know, a lot of ones I did were, were like, point of load they weren't like for the whole vehicle um that had a whole yeah. team behind it which you know very very good good engineers but like um even at the point of load it was just like you always had this fight for like board area of ceramics versus like capacitance because like you couldn't use electrolytics so like oh man how do i get like the 100 microfarad here <laughs> like no yep. like it takes yeah. up all my board area so anyway um uh yeah, so that's Bef- an example. Before we get too deep into the the design side of things on the Faraday RF, uh, maybe we could start with what is Faraday RF? Oh, yeah. Because I do remember I tried to explain it when you guys were launching this stuff, and um, I think he, one of you two wrote to me on Twitter, you're like, yeah, you didn't quite get it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now's your chance. Are you waiting yeah, for me, um, right? <laughs> So Yeah, I was waiting for you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, well, yeah, why don't you, why don't you sure, do it? Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so F- Faraday RF is a... Is a 900 megahertz, uh, as it's currently designed right now, 900 megahertz um, digital radio that's meant to be uh, an open source platform for communications within amateur radio. Um, and how this differs from other r- digital radios is that, uh, and besides just being open source, is that uh, the the idea is to allow allow a, allow ham radio to be a means of doing other things. So rather than getting on and specifically making quote unquote contacts with other people, um, if amateur radio is a medium to do other things and pass data and and create networks, then, uh, there's the ability to, um, to make engine, to make ham radio a software problem. So if ham radio is a software Uh, problem and not a hardware problem, or it doesn't have to be a hardware problem, so you can do things 
that are interesting, like, okay, let's take and put a bunch of these radios around an area, drive them around. There are com- little computers in themselves, uh, and they go in and out of range all the time. Um, and that's a common problem with even ham radio. Uh, but why can't we make a delay tolerant network? All it is is a bunch of software and some radios. So, you know, like, why? I see. So now, if, so if each, each node is like a chat program that's talking back, right, and someone is regularly typing, just as a bad example, but they're regularly typing, then it just caches those messages until they hit back into the something like well, that uh, well, area. Yeah, almost, almost. almost yeah. So, so, and, and again, I haven't, <laughs> it's, I've been a little busy moving around uh, California here. Uh, I haven't, I, ha- I don't have the, like, you know, like, like the, the elevator story, elevator pitch on the top of my head, but the, um, um, like a delay trollant network is is fascinating because it's it isn't necessarily just a caching thing. Like the the example I use is is um, if if I'm hiking out in the mountains of California and I, and I, I don't have anyone that I can I can I can talk to, uh, but I want to send a message to Bryce. He's in Los Angeles. I'm up in the Sierras somewhere or Yosemite, and. I'm I, I, I type them I type my message out or want to send my photo or, or, or data or, or whatnot. I send I send these things and it's just sits there waiting, you know, and then you know, you know, um Joe or Jen or someone's You're saying it sits there sits there waiting because it they don't it doesn't have any other uh transceivers to talk Exactly. To. It just sits there waiting uh okay. in a delay tolerant network. It waits until Joe or Jen drives by with an, with one of these radios that can talk to to me. Um it makes a connection without me ever knowing. It says, "Oh, hey, you're you're mobile. You're you're driving. Let me dump my data to you because you're likely to get out of the mountains and into the civilization." So you make the communication. You you, you dump it. You dump it to them. It's now stored and forward. It's it's stored on those people's radios as well. Huh. They're driving right. around. It finally gets to a city and then connects to the main internet. It dumps that data. It finds its way to Bryce. And now I've made a connection. It might have taken six hours to get there, but it made it. And um, then you can do the reverse. Bryce wants to respond to me, and and he does the reverse, and it finds people generally within the area. Now, this is this is a forward looking thing for Faraday. This isn't currently what it does, yeah. but this mm-hmm. is the idea. It's, a, it's of also like one a platform example that we're trying. It's, to it's one thing that we, make, we thought was very neat. Yeah, and it's yeah, um, sure, sure. Yeah, it's, one of the other examples is like in general, like most like di- especially digital communications in in ham radio. Like a lot of the popular ones are you know, are keyboard to keyboard, right? So. Um, PSK 31, or I think it was a JT8 to the current, like, like rage, or maybe I'm already behind the curve and there's something else, but like, um, but like, yeah, there has to be someone else sitting there, right? <laughs> the idea, like it was literally made such that I want to talk to someone else who is also sitting there talking to me, right? Which is kind of like just how people for literally a hundred years mm-hmm. have approached ham radio right. right it's it's replacing the adc to you know audio amplifier and then microphone system to whatever right well, it's just like it's, it's like it's i want to talk to someone as if they're in the room with me right so they're both sit we're both sitting yeah. there talking right whereas like uh-huh. you don't do that for the internet right like, the internet like you don't expect the person to necessarily be there right like like you're transferring data you're transferring information in a way that um, in some ways is is delay tolerant like okay like the person checks the forum on say like the ev blog like hours after the other person responded to them all right like like you don't expect mm-hmm. that person to be sitting there waiting for your response so that's kind of how ham radio like <laughs> obviously you guys don't hang out on irc very <laughs> no, often no no we don't uh... um man I, yeah um, <laughs> um so we're trying to like create a platform that allows people to experiment and uh-huh. uh, really change some of these these approaches in ham radio. You know, like, all right, I don't want to assume that someone has to be sitting there to talk to me. What can I do with that? Um, and it, as you said, like getting into examples, uh, another really cool example, and this kind of has an AMSAT, uh, you know, um, portion to it, like, is, okay, well, these things are really small and like AMSAT currently does a lot of bent pipe, right? Like, okay, same idea. Someone has to be there to talk to you. I transmit up. It repeats it down immediately. That person responds back to me. Um, all right. Well, uh-huh. like what? Like why can't you have like a digit, like some digital storm forward on the satellite such that if I'm communicating, like I, I let's say I have something out in the in Joshua Tree, now, like three hours away from LA, you know, and it's like, or, or someone, one of my friends is out there, right, and they want to talk to me, right? Like why can't an AMSAT satellite have a little? store and forward on it that they when a satellite passes over upload to the satellite and then when it passes over la or san francisco or, or even like new england right like 
they, you know, someone can downlink that and then respond back, right? Like, why can't you do that? Uh, I would just say, like, uh, I realized that there's no, like, more immediate, <laughs> we didn't give any more, like, immediate, like, current mm-hmm. examples um, that weren't, like, stern forward. So I just to say, like, like uh, as, as a general data platform within Ham Radio that's open source, uh, you can think of Faraday as a really easy way uh, to make Ham Radio a software problem where data is data going over Ham Radio. It, 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 and and our, what, we're, what we're pushing for and almost and very close to is, is like it's a TCP IP connection, just like the internet. It, it's a wireless wire. And when you do that, suddenly over Ham Radio, if, like, if, if two people have one in the area and they want to talk, let's say, keyboard to keyboard, you, just, you can literally you can fire up IRC and just send it right through because it's TCP IP. It just flies right through your, your device. Suddenly, Ham Radio is using you know, these modern tools. Um, now, if I want to go and, say, have an audio communications, you know, digital, digital voice is a big mm-hmm. thing within Ham Radio. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, in my opinion, the, um, the focus has been to make voice fit into a really right, small right. area, like a, sm- like, sorry, a small frequency spectrum. Like, that's not the problem we have. Like, you go higher in frequency, and it's just, it's, you know, there's tons of bandwidth. Um, you know, and there's open source tools. Like, if, 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 if Faraday is just a wireless wire, and you can network that, um, I can suddenly use Opus, which is a, well, an open source audio codec, and I have digital audio um, coming through both sides of, of the radio. And um, and if it's that mobile as a platform, I can write applications for it. It's just your standard. It looks like a standard Ethernet connection on your computer when you plug it in. Yeah. So you keep you keep saying ham radio though too, and so like this is ISM band, right? Ham radio has. Uh, has a band that goes over the the ISM band 900 megahertz. So if you have your ham radio license in 900 megahertz, you can transmit much higher power. You can transmit um, than than ISM can. And I, I believe within ISM, the maximum limits um, of effective radiated power from your antenna is about four watts. It's like 36 dBm. It's like one watt um, for I think from, for 900, something like that. Yeah, I, I forget where it is in, in that band. But if you have your ham radio license, uh, you can transmit hundreds of watts, uh, one of the, thousands of watts, one of the depending big on the differences, band. Though, one of the big differences, and actually, there's actually an article on FaradayArch.com about this, um, is if you're using ISM band equipment, legally, technically, you can't change the hardware, right? Like, it is... It is tested, e- like EMI, EMC compliant sure. to part 15. And, let's, and right? let's put some names to this too, because I think that would be helpful for, at least for me, right? So like I've been using little LoRa modules, which are not obviously high ba- bandwidth, but they are in the 900 megahertz frequency range, right? And you're saying that mm-hmm. I can't go in and decap a chip and tweak a thing on the silicon and, and deal with that, right? Because I- You get into like a legal gray zone, right? Like where like technically no one's going to catch you. Of and course. Sure, like, like we know everyone basically does it. Like look at Hackaday. Every, every, every you know, couple months is a really crazy cool project, right? And someone did something essentially like this and no one really cares, right? Like in terms of FCC and like, you right, know, actually right. like legal issues. Um but technically, that's not really how it works. Right. And um, if you want it to be broadly deployed as well, then you would never suggest that people do that, right? You want it to do within the confines of the, the law and everything else. Yeah. And especially if you're selling it, because like once you're selling it, you yeah. become like a target. Like like if, if suddenly a company opens up and they're making a bunch of, you know, ISM band, uh, you know, Internet of Things stuff and they don't do compliance testing, once the FCC comes knocking, they're in big trouble really big sure. trouble. Um, yeah. Whereas if you're just a person working on a project, no one's re- like, it's not worth usually their time uh, to, mm-hmm. to, to go after you. With amateur radio, you are literally allowed, like you are deemed savvy enough to know that you are operating your own custom hardware in compliance. Like you are, you've passed some tests you, that you know basics about radio. So they say, all right, good. Like we trust that you are you know, competent enough to do this correctly, you know, stay good. Um, and that's one of the big differences is you can then go and like, you know, sell these things and, and, and people can build big projects that, um, you know, can be open source and, um, and really can kind of take on a life of their own, um, without having to have like VC capital and all this stuff that like to get like, like an EMC test is several thousand dollars. <laughs> and if you change, if you change a part, like got to do it again. Or even for like you, you had that net, right. that uh, firmware issue like yeah. a couple year or two ago where like they, there was a law that like oh hey like let's like lock down the firmware because that's part of the configuration of your hardware right in routers right so in like I think in the routers. whole like um, WRTG or whatever that that 
custom open source router stuff. You know, you know that was an issue. Yeah, yeah, we got yeah, yeah. Open WRT. WRT. Yeah, yeah. Chris, um, Chris, to answer your question directly, um, um, and besides, like the compliance and stuff, which which you know, you're allowed to change things, and 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 as long as you deem them good and they are good, they're good. But um, from like a use standpoint, like why ham radio flourishes in an application like Faraday is because if you think about Faraday on the ISM band, you think about like, well, what, what's, what's the difference in the community? In the ISM band community, generally everyone wants to share uh-huh. 900 megahertz, but not talk to each other. Whereas in ham radio, everyone wants to talk to each other on, on 900 megahertz or, or any other frequency. So that's why you see these large infrastructure projects like APRS packet radio or like like uh, uh hssm uh ham mm-hmm. that stuff going on where you have these large you know regional projects or national projects um that have thousands of people cooperating over you know over these 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 the, the spectrum because we want to talk to each other because if you know aprs we used on Rich, richie one our high altitude balloon in college we used the aprs system to track our, our balloon and it, and it, and it just, it made everything work. We didn't even have to chase the, the, the balloon. We just let it go. Right, and then we went right, and picked right, right. it up on the ground, you know, miles later, like we didn't even chase it because yeah, the infrastructure okay. was there. And, um, so like it allows you to do these things that you otherwise can't do, um, in a more closed infrastructure or society. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I, I'm thinking about it cause it's like for you guys, it's a product, right? You, you are selling this as a product, but ultimately you're yeah. selling a tool set, right? And that's different that's than yep. a lot of the things that operate in the ISM band, which are like quasi consumer, again, like thinking about the lower radio that I, I use, right? It's a consumer, I'm the consumer of that chip and that, that technology. I want to do it for something that I'm designing into, but then it's, it's using this very constrained set of, of frequency bands and frequency methods within that band, right? Um, yeah. So I'm just trying to kind of just trying to delineate <laughs> against these other tools that are out there. You guys are making a new tool set for people to play around in the ISM band using software. And this is the hardware. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the, the interesting thing is that if you really think about what Faraday RF is, yeah, yeah we're only building the hardware, hardware because hardware is, is very hard to really build. Really like even getting Faraday to production, there are several big roadblocks. That sure. like, oh man, you know, you just built a hundred of these and like, you know, you have an issue you have to work through and like it, it, it takes weeks. It can take a lot of time and, you know, even even now, the boards have been open source for a while, and I don't know of anyone who's actually went and built one for cheaper, right? Like, like you have to build in high qualities, and that's a lot of capital. So, like, we looked at it and right, said, all right, right if right. we want this to be a tool and this to be kind of a community, we need to provide, like, we know how to build hardware. Let's build hardware, make that not an obstacle that other people have to solve, right? And so we can solve the the, the application, the software. So, okay, so now let me ask this against, again, another competing product I, that I think is a competing product, but I'm, I think actually is not a competing product. So so now <laughs> yep. Faraday RF versus yeah. SDR, right? So we have Mike from HackRF on here all the time, right? Ah, so good like, one. So good. then what's the difference at that point? So so the thing you have to ask yourself when you ask about SDR versus like Faraday, and, and it's not like we're in like competition or anything. It's like we're all in the no, same boat. No, no, no. Boat. I just want to just yeah. d- differentiate, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like, differentiation. Yeah. Think about what problem you're trying to solve with SDR. You're, you're like a lot of people say, oh, well, like, like an SDR allows you to change your modulation if you want to and you're so flexible. You really think about it in ham radio in the last 20 years since the, the internet has really taken hold and, 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 and ham radio is like technologically falling behind a lot. Um, what is the problem you're solving? Is it, mm-hmm. hey, you know, this, this audio frequency shift keying or this, this Gaussian frequency shift keying isn't really working out. I, I really should go and do that, you know, orthogonal frequency modulation. Like, like no, no <laughs> one says that. It's like, no, the problem is that it's really difficult to have medium speed data just work on ham radio. Like, like you can't just uh-huh. hook up a radio and get, you know, you know 30 kilobits a second out of out of your radio in a, in a, in some infrastructure that's that's developed or like a radio you know if you, you that's the problem that we're solving so and and the way and so and so Faraday is a very low power device whereas SDR is not a low power device yeah also on the on the line of of you know what problem you're solving software defined radio is really flexible right like a lot of people will say hey like I can just change the modulation I can change the entire radio with software like, like, sure, but like when you're looking at, okay, how do I get medium speed data and how do I, how do I do these applications like store and forward or, 
um, some form of, of, of network through, um, through, you know, through ham radio, like SDRs just solve one part of the problem. That's the mod- like really just the modulation, right? It solves how do I transmit and receive bits of data? Okay, well then what do you do with it? Like, how does it route? How does it, what is the application? Like, so you'll see, like, if you were to take someone working on a, a new SDR radio, they're going to spend a lot of time. And in the end, they can put a bit in and it will come out the other end a bit. Okay, now what? Right? You just spent a lot of time making this whole new modulation, and this whole new radio effectively. And in the end, you still can't really do anything interesting with the data you send through it, right? That's why you have like huge companies like Broadcom or whatever who do, you know, cell phones that are SDRs. Like they have whole teams who are like taking those bits from the radios and actually like doing stuff with it, like, like, like Apple or whatever, like actually making the, the applications and the software and the, the platforms that all this code runs on. Um, to actually do something interesting with the data. So that's why Faraday is a harder to find radio, right? Like it's it's actually, it's got CC430, uh, right? So in it, so it's it's defined radio. We looked at it and said, we're not trying to solve a problem that is really needs flexibility. We just need a GMSK or something that basically can get tens to hundreds of kilobits or kilobod of data. And then we really need to focus on what what do we do with that data? How do we write around what makes it interesting to use? And that still has taken a long time, you know, to, to figure out. And, and we didn't even have to solve the modulation problem. Yeah, it kind of yeah. sounds like it's a it's an abstraction level kind of thing, right? So so at yep. the SDR level, you're you're like you said, you're doing modulation schemes and you're really everything's wide open. It's almost like FPGAs in terms of like I mean obviously it's Sometimes it's FPGAs, but it's more like <laughs> you can you can design the whole world, right? You can design the whole world and the whole system, but it, you might just end up going to put a soft processor on an FPGA in the first place, right? Yeah. So it sounds like in, in this case, you guys are like, okay, we've got a processor, we've got a method, we know what we want to do, we're just trying to get this job done. So the job done that you're saying is piping data through. Yeah. And that an SDR might end yeah, up doing interesting stuff with it. Right. Yeah. And the SDR might end up doing it the same way that you're doing it, but you just remove that part of the equation. Yeah, yeah we, we literally knocked off six months a year of work. Just yeah. Boom, okay, let's focus on the actual problem. So why didn't this exist in the ISM band prior to you know, Faraday? <laughs> that's what we kept asking ourselves. We kept asking okay. ourselves. We thought someone was going to do this prior. But like, like we, we literally thought, we started talking about something like Faraday back in 2010. But we okay. were in college, you know, and then, you know, we just didn't have time. Um, and we really didn't start working on it, like, like, until uh, 2014 ish was when mm-hmm. we really dove into it, right when AMSAT started tapering off. Uh-huh. And in those four years, no one had really come out with anything. And even now that, uh-huh. that that Faraday has come out, I haven't heard of anything even really like it. Like I would love for people to to go and do that. Um, it's interesting because it is a hard problem to solve. Like like it's it's really really easy to do something like okay, I send bits in onto this radio channel and bits come out the other end, right? Basically a serial connection, right? Like, okay, that's easy. But mm-hmm. what do you do with it? Like, how do you, what makes it yeah. interesting to use? And that's a really hard problem. To add to that, the, going through this process, I believe what, what, what we found was, was that if you, if you get down to actually doing like a Faraday radio, uh, we, you realize there's, th- there's several major hurdles. One is hardware. What hardware do you use? Do you use like a LoRa module that's already built and you can buy commercially? Uh, you know, what flexibility do you have with that? Is it in the correct bands? Um, is it always going to be there? Uh, and is an open source? Because like, ultimately, we open source Faraday because I would love to have other people come in and just blow past us because the goal is not to make a lot of money with Faraday. The goal is to improve the hobby, improve the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, now, yeah. so hardware is one, and that, that's why we did hardware, enable it. The second is, 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 is the application side. And that's... Really, the fundamental reason I think other people haven't really been doing this within within ham radio is that it takes a lot of effort because uh, you you need to be a software almost a software engineer to really dive heavily in, in, into like the nitty gritty parts of it, not all of it, but um, and then you got to ask yourself, okay, I can make bytes come in one side and come out the other side. Now, what do I do with it? And that and that takes a level of creativity. So not only do you have to be good. Technically, you have to suddenly start thinking, sort of like in, in, in like a in like a new application fun way. What do I do with ham radio in the twenty first century? 
besides just talk with people. Right. Yeah. And, and that is answer a that. great it's question not that I always have too. Yeah. Right. So it's like, like that. <laughs> right. I'm good you with say people. You, you do, do here. here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. So, so just to preface that, I've been, a, I've been an amateur radio operator since like 2004. I love it. It's given me a lot of, a lot of good things in my life and, and I still, I still love it. Um, but I'm going to be quite honest. Like most of my peers don't care about it. Like it's a thing. It's just it's antiquated, and 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 that and that hurts me. And that's and that's why one of the reasons that that Bryce and I did Faraday is that we wanted to see how can we make ham radio more relevant in the in, in today's society. Um, and 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 I and I think we had a lot of success with it. Um, I think we're in a little a little bit of a lull right now. Well, you're in good company though too. So Derek Kozel, who an SDR type uh, who's a GNU radio like he had very similar things to say that like when you when you are applying the new methods and you bring in new people in it kind of starts to you know it basically is it's a new solution space right it's like telephone solved a lot of the same problems that you know ham radio did right in certain regards but or cell phones then did that same thing as well right but now it's like finding that next frontier of like what's interesting what's fun to poke at right right, right. i mean like smartphones like, in the age of the internet like smartphones yeah. are phones but they created a whole new industry of of apps and mobile data and yeah. and this uh, uh, you know all pre- omnipresent sort of um connection so like with ham radio how does ham radio survive in a, in a, or not survive but like how, what does ham radio do if you have this really easy means of connecting to a local infrastructure that's now national infrastructure um you have you can send you know messages or data or or connect programs or speak audio from one ham radio to another digitally and it routes through the internet or routes through some some RF protocol, or you have on top of this a delay tolerant network, which I think is a more interesting part, like more like unique to ham radio itself, like a delay tolerant network where suddenly you have this infrastructure of like mobile transmitter receivers that you know you can link up at indeterminate times, yeah. and the network just works. Um, yeah. And like, what applications can yeah. come from that? You know, right. We're just. Well, I think at the end of the day, it's a it's a use case thing, right? So, like, the, the other things I think about in the ISM band that I've seen is like the Gotenna, right? Gotenna is a the consumer level device where you connect over right. Bluetooth, it goes over ISM band, yeah. talks to another Gotenna, and basically, it's, you talk to your friends at a concert and say, "Where are you?" Right? Because the cell towers don't work. It's like okay, but that's like that's applying a technology to a simple like. That, like simple human problem, right? Because it it's just a human thing, right? It's yeah. like oh, that, so. Gotenna right. is an interesting use case, right? Like Gotenna. Um, now, granted, I don't own one, so maybe I'm missing a point here. But like, yes, yeah, so you have the it. whole concert gate situation where you have tons of people in an area. It's overloaded the cell towers. All right, so let's talk off the cell towers. Or you have like the rural um, hunting like aspect. Okay, we're in the middle of nowhere and no service. Let's talk to each other. Okay, well, you're applying this ISM license uh, free band technology to sure, these yeah. people the r- the rural aspects much more interesting in my opinion where okay we're going to talk to each other when there's no infrastructure all right well we we don't have licenses right we don't have licenses so um the company has to use ism bands because they don't ex- like imagine gotenna where you had to get a ham radio license like who would buy that yeah that, right? that's true like, yep. you're not going to go to rei and see it in the stores if that's the case and like oh yeah by the way before you buy this you need to take a test right so like wrong market so with with Gotenna, yeah, exactly. they have they're, to they're dead in the water. They have yep. to compromise. Okay, we're going to use these higher frequencies that have the data capability, but on, honestly, only go a couple miles at best, right? We all looked at the walkie talkies in like Walmart, right? And like you're like forty miles, mm, like mountain to mountain, maybe like you know, you know, like okay, stretching it, you know, right, right. So like they, I think generally that's like the the, the criticism i've heard of thing, even things like, like you know like gotenna where yeah you know, right they have right. to do that because Two miles they don't have, line of they don't have <laughs> people like generally putting up repeaters now i think gotenna do have a repeater mode but like you have to be someone really nice right um in the area to do that but i think my point with all that was that is that this is i mean that still feels a little trite to me you know what i mean like it's it's a it's a problem i think it's actually a commercial problem that they're hitting decently well it's a niche market and yeah. that that's fine but i'm just saying that like that seems trite whereas you guys are talking about keeping ham radio alive it's like you know so now someone does have to take a test and does want to play with this new medium or this new method right so yeah yeah so, 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 so now what what to do to actually keep yeah. it interesting yeah, you know, actually, that brings up a really good point. When Bryce and I were originally developing this, and we were thinking, like, okay, well, you know, who are we making this for? 
besides us because like obviously we wanted it good but good questions to ask yep 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 yeah you know we're like okay like like <laughs> you and i are exactly the same <laughs> maybe other people are as well <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so like like you know who, who's who's who are we looking to 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 market this towards because um you know in the end it is a product and like in you know if 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 it doesn't catch on, then there's really no, yeah, you no point. You want to sell in them, right? You got you to get yeah. the volumes up, so you got to sell them to more yeah. than two people. So, yeah. yeah. So, like, okay. Um, well, are we going to be looking at like all the ham radio people currently existing? And the answer was no, because most ham radio people, not most, but like a good amount of the active ham radio people, are just totally fine, and content doing what's currently available. I'm we pretty sure a good, that, good chunk of them are not even using smartphones, let alone cell phones. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I mean, there's, so there, there's a, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of like, you know, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different. Uh, I mean, just people, go to Hackaday Supercon. There's a lot of people with a ham license there. Yeah. They, but what, sure. what we that's realized, more of our market, right? What we realized <laughs> was there's a lot of people, including a lot of our friends and coworkers, that had their license, were interested, but just didn't really see the modern point in using it. And we're like, hadn't used why? Years. Why don't they do this? And then we mm-hmm. realized, well, it's hard to do anything relevant today. And what is relevant today? Relevant today is is having some network means that you can easily transfer data and use applications and interact with the outside world over ham radio. There is a catch though to that. And the, the catch is that you can't just replace the internet, right? Because like if you suddenly if we were suddenly came come out and go, oh, well, this is just basically a Wi-Fi router that is higher power because you have a ham license, which is essentially HamNet and 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 uh, HSSM. Uh, then you get the question of, well, why not just use the internet? I don't even need a license then, right? Right, which, right exactly. Why, why right, go through all exactly, this trouble? Which right? is a completely right. valid point. And what we're trying to do at Faraday is say, right, well, there are many aspects that ham radio is the only way to solve. Like, you would never do a store and forward network in, in, um, in like, the, you know, normal internet or cell phone use uh, because it, you, you just, you, you always have connection. Everything is built for a connection that is currently present. Whereas in ham radio, it is completely acceptable to lose service for, you know, a day or two as you're camping, right? Like imagine, you know, imagine if you go to a certain part of Los Angeles and just have no service on your cell phone, you're going to be absolutely, you know, pissed, (laughs) you know? Um, Whereas, you know, if you go to the country, you just kind of expect it to not work in like the mountains, right? But in ham radio, even in APRS, you go to certain parts of, of relatively populated areas and APRS doesn't really work. There's nothing there. So like it, there's a different, like people have different expectations and therefore there's different applications that could never work in, uh, in normal, uh, like internet connected situations. Um, like store and forward is not really a thing. It just doesn't exist in like, you would never do that with Facebook or like, you know, you would never do that. Uh, YouTube, right? Good example. It's you're, you just expect it to be there whenever you're online. Yeah. Um, whereas in ham radio, like I want to send a message, and I'm okay if it takes an hour and a half to get there. I'm okay if it takes, you know, or if send a message, send it, send an image or a data file. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's why you don't see those other things. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. So I'm trying to trying to find like a good a good example. I'm thinking about like okay, mm-hmm. so how about like a trail camera, yep. like where <laughs> you're trying to see if. Uh, Bigfoot's walk by, right? So it's got a motion sensor and it takes a picture and then it has a timestamp, right? And every time it senses motion, it takes a picture and it's like squirrel, 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 and then finally Bigfoot, right? <laughs> so, so like yeah, so, some parts okay. of the country, right? Cell phones are great. Some parts, Wi-Fi are great. Some parts, if you waited long enough, you could do slow scan or you could do whatever, right? If you're waiting and you're watching and all the other stuff, but that's maybe yeah. a situation where nothing else would work i'm trying to just kind yeah. of think of these so, corner so cases. chris so chris the the yeah um, you, <laughs> you, you reminded me of a of, a, of an interesting bigfoot uh, story a, yeah interesting bigfoot story <laughs> when i saw bigfoot um so i we ran into the same problem which is like whoa what do we do like 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 what 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 is the killer app of ham radio and and realize you can't answer that question you just can't do it and and like if if it was that easy to, yeah. to 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 answer, someone would have already answered it by now. And sure. that's and it'd that's probably be what, commercial at that point too, right? It yeah. wouldn't be ham radio. <laughs> so what we realized was that was that um, you know, our you know, like like okay, this isn't like a million dollar industry where someone's just going to try to find out how to do it. It's like this is a slow moving sort of like endeavor of a whole community. And the we realized that that you can't pin it down to one 
use case. But what you can do is you can realize that, okay, what are people willing to do and like support like a, like a, like a, like a half finished thing as, and, and they help, help with it. And is well, to do any of these end use actions, you need a platform. You need some means to get data from one end to the other and network it. So realize that mm-hmm. that is a product of itself of like putting it out there and making it easy to develop. So yeah, that has been our edu- main I mean, just stuff. education, like no one yeah. buying a Wi-Fi router usually is going to want to say, huh, how does this Wi-Fi router work? And like, can I program on it? Like very right. small can community I, let does me that. Let me dig into the code here. dig into the right, code, right? right? <laughs> like, like you do, so, I mean, you, there are people who do that. But like in Faraday and in ham radio, in ham radio, like a sizable portion of people doing stuff would ask that question. I want to know how it works. Can mm-hmm. I build something? Can I change it? Right. Yeah. So, so that's like another difference from uh, from normal commercial technology. Continuing where I was going with that was that was that um, okay. We, we you build this platform, um, and and people help you as they find you know you can do fun things with it. Initial you know send an image. I remember the first time I could up like how to send an image over here Faraday. It was just like super cool to me. You know I and and I was as I was digging into the lower levels, going okay, well like like what if I wanted to write my own my own, um, you know, uh, uh, automatic retry re- re- request protocol. And like, like, what is that? Like, what, how does that work? Oh, like, that's actually how, like, how, like, like a TCP works in, 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 in a nutshell where, okay, like, like, let me, or let me figure out how, to, how can I make sure that if I send an image, you know, byte or, or sorry, a packet or a couple packets at a time, how do I make sure all of it gets there in a the correct order 100% of the time? And like coding it all up and realizing, oh, wow, like I just coded this up. I learned from an educational standpoint, something that would be pretty hard to do, or you'd have to do it all from scratch on like your own ISM, you know, module that you bought 100% from scratch. Um, you know, it was a cool w- means of like, well, this is useful. I can get, I'm using ham radio. I'm like learning how to build, you know, like some lower level networking protocol functionality and like why it works why how sliding window works and why you'd use it and uh and like okay this is like an educational in denver so what we realized was this platform that we're building was also a really good means for ham radio to continue being highly educational to those who wanted to learn about wireless communications and you could either dive right in and like you know start learning how all, all of these lower level protocols worked and like why we did what we did or, or what you could do with it. Or you could just use it for the application's sake and say all the stuff that we've been doing, you can just use it to like, you know, make your connection from one radio to another yeah. and send voice. So we realized that as we were building this platform for ham radio, uh, there was this educational use case that you could use it for that no one else was answering. It was like you either buy your module off of SparkFun that has bytes in, bytes out, or like, like D-Star there's no or networking like layer in it, or you go straight to your Zigbee or Laura. I, I, I've never played with Laura, but like, or like, or like yeah, Ham Radio right, D-Star, right. where it's like it's already all done for you, and it's really hard to figure out what, what, why things are doing what they're doing, or to hack at it and change it. Mm. So we wanted to, sense. we wanted to give something that was extremely hackable and documented. So how do people get started with it? Yeah, right now. Yeah. 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 So like, okay, and they go yeah, buy it. Good. They they buy the the hack the Faraday. Well, they're sold out. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, so <laughs> they starters, don't build their own, yeah. or they borrowed from a friend. <laughs> we'll build their and, own right now. Yeah. Um, like I said, we were taking a bit of a break. Like we sold all yeah. of them uh, that we built, uh, and um, sizable, sizable number. Um, but we're not like doing like there's we just don't have the time to really do that right now, and we still haven't necessarily answered the question of like making it just just kind of work. Um, we did shift in like six months before stopping. We basically started realizing, okay, let's actually make this look like uh, like an Ethernet port on your computer. When you plug it in, it literally looks like an Ethernet port, and um, that started abstracting a, a bit of our work and making it really simplifying it a lot. Uh, so we we haven't f- actually like literally a few commits away from from implementing that and making it really useful, uh, but then we both left SpaceX and joined startups. So like it just stopped, um, which is unfortunate. So to answer yeah. to answer Chris's question, yeah. Um, so once once they come back, or or e- even in general, like you can look, um, um, we the main brunt of Faraday is actually software, and, and it's that that learning how to integrate ham radio, but make radio software problem, and the applications of ham radio software problem. Well, the website is the yeah. the radios themselves. Yeah, the radios themselves give you that access. Um, like, uh, uh, it, it's a little difficult to answer right now because yeah. they're sold out. But well, well, actually, let me let me actually I actually will build on that. Sorry, we also like I I'm still in rocket mode at the moment. Like, 
you know, spent all day building rockets. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> um, with, with, with Faraday, like, okay, the hardware's not there. Like, we're not a software radio, but technically you could build a software radio that does this. Like, if you took an SDR and you programmed it such that, okay, one of the um, input outputs for the data coming in from the, the radio is put into Faraday software, like it is put into a, a what's called a ton, right? Uh, um, it's it's a, a Linux way of doing um, uh, basically a software interface, virtual Ethernet port, and virtual um, Ethernet if, port. If that is your, if if you take your software defined radio and use any any form of getting data from one point to another, and then interface that, then actually the Faraday software that's on GitHub will will actually work with that. Like um, or wait, some on some of the newer branches, the current master branch is 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 not that, but on the actual development branch, um, and so that is like how Faraday is not really bound to the hardware. Um, like it is more of an idea, right? It's an idea of, okay, how do we make interfacing with amateur radio more digitized and abstracted, you know, using it to do cool things, not that ham radio is, is the act of itself is cool. Right. And, uh, so we go into our GitHub and looking at the code, uh, especially the development branch, we can, we can send you show notes to the actual development branch, um, where this ton tap stuff was being done uh that's kind of a good start um again it's in a weird funky place where it's almost done but ton the the ton tap yes so if, if anyone out there had um and you can fake this on your own computer you can make the ton wrap around itself and like just do software development which was also the thing that we were going for was like abstract out the hardware as well so you can build up this entire infrastructure just in software for testing and in developing now um it's just bites in and bites out. So like 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 the Faraday hardware itself, all, all it was doing in its latest um, re- re- revision is taking a bunch of bytes from a serial port, packetizing them and setting them across the radio link and then un- undoing it, that all and sending it back to your serial port, which is then goes to your ton network Ethernet device. So basically, um, if you have any device, you know, even, maybe even a lower module can do this. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, just sends serial bytes in to serial bytes out. You can essentially use the Faraday software. And um, and so what is what does that software actually look yeah, like? Some, some massaging. Like, so is it like needed, just like a Python script or what is? Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm kind of getting at. Is like yeah, it's Python script. Okay, yeah, so. a lot of it's in Python. Yeah, a lot of it's in Python. And the the ton we're referring mainly to the ton tap stuff. There was some very custom hard software that that is just I think is the main current master branch is more of the like the the more custom like not proprietary the more custom just like not standard stuff whereas the development branch is is what we're talking about which is like kind of the actual thing we need we need we want to do and yeah that um that that interface just interfacing with the uh with like as an ethernet port made everything much easier and if 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 you just go in there and you you see if you you will have to write some form of code essentially to uh, in Python, mainly, uh, I guess you could do anything, but uh, you have to make your hardware, whether it's a software-defined radio or a LoRa module or anything, talk to a ton. And if you do that, then essentially the the Faraday I/O hard, uh, package that's on uh, PyPy. So if you like pip install Faraday I/O, right, like that should actually work for you if if you if you appear as a serial report that has bits on it <laughs> yeah know? and then and to, to to add that the um so what we really need is to is to wrap up that last few commits that i was working on to um to to bring in that full functionality of ethernet in ethernet out um and then the fun stuff starts yeah what people can really have fun with within ham radio which is which is okay you have this wireless wire through ethernet you can control these different frequencies um let's start building ham radio applications that that utilize these platforms you know anywhere from you know a few kilobits per second to to a couple hundred kilobits per second is is a capability and um doing things like digital voice like like the first easy one we wanted to get was just use like like opus uh the opus codex to this pipe digital voice through these wireless radios and get voice in voice out um, then you could, you know, pipe in chat programs. That, that seems like the most uh, right, right. backwards. Uh, so what we did is we built yep. this whole structural yeah. in this platform. Yeah. And what we did is we replicated <laughs> ham radio. Yeah. Guys, check it out. <laughs> so cool. Um, we did it. Look, we're talking over radio. <laughs> so, you know, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, though, it's a good test because suddenly, um, you know, if you have this, this, this constant, 
in this constant bitstream or byte stream of, uh, of of voice data going through the network. Now you know, it's between two radios that you can talk, you know, over the air. Then you can write the software, uh, the backend, to actually pipe that from one over the internet from one station to another. So now you create this, you know, you just have a simple server that basically takes connections in and then. Uh, connects them with the other connections, you know, just like an internet voice over IP would do. Probably just tie into the voice over IP mm-hmm. infrastructure. Um, sure. Then, but like the main thing I wanted to do to v- develop, like it, once I once I start back on on developing, and once I finally move into my new apartment um, and settle in, which is, um, I really want to jump into. I want to create a delay teller network for ham radio and um, uh, start creating a, 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 a an infrastructure that. Uh, can pass messages, images, any data you want, voice clips. Um, can pass that through and you know, route them through some mobile stations, like write to algorithms to actually say, okay, like these stations are active and they're moving. You know, all ferries have a GPS on them, so you know where they are. Um, the the it, it's it's they're moving, they're going near this other station that might want to talk. Like like use that as a routing network um, that might take an hour to complete. Um, and, and this is, this is an application that is really only in like some NASA and universities and like, um, in the disaster relief, um, applications, uh, but it's super, super accessible to ham radio and is a really interesting, in my opinion, application for, for Faraday software and hardware. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We, really, we're at a turning point where like, uh, um, we're almost through t- this development of the initial like new platform. Um, using these networked interfaces, and yeah, uh, other than um, continuing that development, like it, it's yeah. it's like that's really the path forward that needs to happen. But yeah, and that's actually a good point where one of those things you learn, especially like in the space industry, um, is kind of like don't be afraid of like throwing out work, right? So the original firmware that I believe is still the master on our GitHub, on Faraday RF's GitHub, is like a very custom like takes bits in through serial and like, you know, uh, packages them in a very customized, you know, protocol and sends it out over RF, han- handles all, all that. And then we realized this every time we wanted to do something new, right? Like, okay, we looked at it one night. I remember we were sitting like at two in the morning, you know, like looking at this development going, how do we send say IRC over the, How do we do a chat program, right? Over Faraday. Uh, and we're like, okay, well, we have to interface with this protocol that we wrote uh, over C report. So now we need to write this like buffer in Python that then like takes the TCP IP stuff and like buffers it in this special way and then puts it out to the Faraday radio that then transmits it and it, you have to do the reverse on the other end. And we're like, whoa, every time we do something like too much, too much, too much yeah. right? <laughs> like, all right. And, yeah. and then we realized, yeah. wait, ton tap. Like we asked one of our, one of our actually, one of the people who bought the, one of the first radios, um, I won't say the name's privacy, but like like that particular person um, gave, has given us a lot of help, right? Just like they, they are very deep in software and very smart and very open to helping and exactly what you want in an open source community, right? And like, and that person like, hey, look at Tuntap. And we looked at it and said, that's exactly what we want. And then mm-hmm. when we realized when we were, were getting it working in, in development, we realized, wow, once this works, like everything is so fast, we can get IRC over it. Like do a chat program over ham radio, IRC. Want to send audio? Okay, and pick pick a Kodak, right? Uh, want to send video or anything? Okay, like it just yeah, it just works, right. and we don't have to write wrappers. And now we once that's in, we, you can move much quicker. So um, we essentially realized we need to throw out some of that mm-hmm. work so we can move quick because we spent way too long trying to uh, mm-hmm. go down one path, you know, and you know that's life. Like that's learning. And that's why this is not, this is a side project. And then, um, right, yeah. right before we actually finished right. uh, that route, like literally going from a cent- at least in my case, um, within like within less than a month, I basically realized I was leaving SpaceX and joining startup. So like it was very quick. Um, so, uh, we didn't really have time to like, I remember trying to finish yeah. it. Um, but it's just, it's all so close, but the idea that we really went through and explained the concept, mm-hmm. which uh, hopefully someone, can take and like really do some cool stuff with yeah before if we if we don't get to it first yeah, that's a good question <laughs> so then. eventually so, we're, we're going back in it yeah. right so how do, how do people how do people get involved and how do they how do they uh how do they jump into this 
this stuff. Uh, well, the Faraday stuff. Yeah, they, yeah. they aside from having the they hardware, they should go on to our um, our website FaradayRF.com. Uh, they should find their way over to our GitHub uh, and look at. Uh, and we should update our GitHub to 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 show the 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 more relevant more, code, um, yeah. recent development branches is, is the main is the main branch. And uh, um, got it. And yeah, I mean, like we're looking to, to, to start helping getting getting back into it, uh, and yeah, developing like the hard part is the software infrastructure, and you don't need a mm-hmm. radio to do this. You can fake you can fake the software through you know your 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 tongue tap and create two fake radios, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, right. uh, start developing and and um, really just the fun part of creating new applications for ham radio. Uh, you know, the initial like we just said, the initial you know easy easy wins, but then. Now it's like the new unique stuff that is only ham radio specific. You know, like how do you, you know, delay talent networks is, is one I keep bringing up. But um, yeah, uh, Bryce and I are hardware engineers <laughs> and we are learning how to be software engineers. Um, so that's right. Know, it's yeah, like, it sounds like it. Uh, um, we're trying to make ham radio way more accessible to software engineers. So if more software engineers want to want to want to learn how to ham radio um, and play with software, uh, they should come give us a give us a ring. So what about, uh, it sounds like both of your startups are also hiring. Uh, we should probably wrap up on that. Uh, how how, uh, how can people get in touch if they're interested in learning more about stealth? Uh, well, I'll let you explain what they are, but uh, how, how do they get in touch if they're interested in spacey type stuff? Go for it, Bryce. I'll, I'll go first. All, all, right. You guys. Um, yeah. all right. So yeah, the startup I joined is called Relativity Space. So uh, we're here in, in Los Angeles and uh, we're actually, we're 3D printing Rocket. Uh, so um as you would, as you would, uh, it's of pretty, course. pretty amazing right. technology, um, right. and uh, you know enough so to, to make me make me jump and and go and, and join the team, and uh, so obviously I do avionics there, but you know in general we, we you know relativity space is building it has built the, what is the world's largest metal three D printer. You can go to relativity relativityspace.com and you can see all, all, all about it, and uh, also three D printing the rocket engines. Uh, our A on one engine has actually that already been fired a uh, hundred times. Uh, so, um, pretty deep in development and, and getting, getting some good hardware. So, um, yeah, look, uh, in terms of what I, I directly look for is, uh, any like avionics, hardware engineers or software engineers, uh, people doing embedded Linux, embedded, anything really actually embedded, uh, type of programming, um, uh, in, at least from an avionics standpoint, um, yeah, go to our careers page on the website and, uh, and, and find a position that's relevant and, and apply, um, I guess if there's nothing there, you could use a contacts or contact us or something. Um, I haven't really thought about that one too much, but um, yeah, we'll get, yeah, yeah. I guess ping me on Twitter. Um, we'll, we'll get your Twitter and also there's a ton of the positions answers. for yeah. like, programming with you know robotics, three um, D printing. If you look at the Stargate, the three D printer, um, it is a big robotics problem, right? And it is a big, big like welding problem because uh, we're literally building the structure of a rocket with a three additive manufacturing. Mm-hmm. So. Um, quite a sizable project and like, yeah I, I, every day I, like uh, I'll, I'll see new progress that's and, crazy like, literally i'll like walk yeah. in and see like the, the printers and like, like you know buzzing away at you know printing metal structures of a rocket and it's like wow that is kind of mind-blowing like that's 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 a rocket <laughs> yeah and ironically you know ironically yeah. like, like there are certain things you're probably not going to hey, look print the future it's over there <laughs> electronics but um you know for me one of the really fun aspects of joining as an avionics engineer uh is how do you design an avionics architecture and system and you know even all the down to electronics um that augments 3d printing like how like traditionally you know it takes a long time to build even a tank, right? Like look at SpaceX, they're right. reusing rocket. One of the big benefits of reusing rocket is you don't have to build a new one, right? You can you can get missions quicker. So um, when you can print a rocket very quickly and in, 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 right. currently it, 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 is, it is looking like 60 days from print to flight is very possible. And uh, that you, now you're starting to look at, okay, um, at least in my past experience, 60 day turnaround time on redesigning an avionics system is incredibly fast. Um, software can change fast, right? But hardware, like that's actually very hard when you heard the first part of this conversation, right? Like all the stuff you have to put into making sure it's going right. to work. All the testing, all the testing. All the, yeah, exactly. I mean, that gets very difficult and you start basically, <laughs> right. You're like, 
I'll just uh, take the same uh, you know metal cutout, please, for my electronics. It's the same <laughs> size. I'll yeah. I'll be over here testing while you guys. Yeah. So that's one. been super fun. So anyone who wants to work in either additive manufacturing on the printing end of it, um, certainly there's a ton of open positions on on relativityspace.com. Uh, and then for avionics, like this, over time we'll be opening more positions. So um, you're act very much actively hiring. But um, yeah, that's get in touch. Uh, really looking for some great candidates. Awesome, cool. Yeah, Brian, how about you? Um, yeah. So I am. So I'm working at a. Uh, we're a little more stealth than 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 Bryce's Bryce's uh, um, uh, <clears throat> workplaces. But uh, I I'm working on autonomous airplanes and. We're doing, uh, we're the, as you do. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I mean, are... you got to do it for both of these things, right? I mean, if one's going to be like naturally, oh, yeah, we're printing rockets, we're autonomous airplanes, uh, whatever, no big deal. So, uh, I, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. Uh, I've been here for a couple months now and we're making really good progress. And, um, I mean, I've, these are, these are like, these aren't drones. These are, these are real airplanes, like full airplanes. I've flown in the airplane. It's, um, and How yeah. I feel. So it's uh, it's. What'd you say? I said, how that how'd that feel? Was it was it scary? <laughs> no, was it like no. my rockets going to space scary, <laughs> well, or is it more like my life is being uh, determined by a robot? Well, that was scary. that was a really cool thing. That's the first time in like you know like I've gotten to <laughs> I've gotten to sit in something that's flying that I've helped build. So that was ex that's a really okay. exciting. You know that's a really exciting right, right, part of engineering, right. and um, so it's it's a really nice talk about really making sure it works yeah. at that point. I mean, it's not like your rocket blows up; it's like you blow up. Yeah. So um, you need to so, you need to at some point yeah. when 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 Dave uh, um, when when Dave can 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 come over and fly right in in your your autonomous airplane, you need to have a mode in there that just goes. I'm sorry, Dave. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Bryce. Um, <laughs> I had to go there. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, we're, we're doing that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a really small team. Um, so we have, uh, we have, you know, between 10 and 20 people. Last time I checked, uh, we were hiring, hiring, we're hiring a lot and it's, uh, we're mainly looking for, uh, right now we're looking for mechanical engineers and, um, and, uh, software engineers. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, yeah. If you want to hit me up for more information, uh, you should contact me on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. Um, but yeah, we're we're flying around. We're um, we're actively building out our our capabilities and um, and fly and doing some cool engineering. So I spend I I mean we're in like engineering mode. So uh, so you know even as an electrical engineer, you know I I'll do a lot of electrical engineering and system design. But you know occasionally I'll also play you know you know um, part time mechanical engineer. You know nothing crazy, but like I, you know I do get to machine metal and do all these set up these tests and, uh, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been it's been a very diverse experience for me and um it's really cool like i'm getting that getting a, like a lot of different hats on even though i think it's a little campy um richard branson is a uh, is famous for saying an entrepreneur is someone who jumps off a cliff and builds a plane on the way down and uh <laughs> that is actually sounds, very so, true <laughs> so, sounds like you guys are doing that that is that is very true um it's a little campy but i mean like yeah i, I agree with the sentiment at least you know I can, I can actually back back that up a little bit because actually I, I heard a great description of it literally today um, that after my experiences at, at, at Relativity Space, you know, have like, you know, at being at a small startup, you know, um, you know, I'm employee number 17, right? Like, so like, like there were more than 17 people on my, on my group at SpaceX, right? So it's a whole different feeling, right? There's, there's like, there's over 20 people now at Relativity, but like it's the, the, the notion of like jumping off a cliff and building an airplane on the way down is... Like when you look at any startup, right? When you look at like burn, like let's take like Uber or anyone. Oh, Uber's probably not a good example for today's climate, but like like any startup that is growing, right? Like you're spending money to grow. So generally, you have a big investment, right? You have like some VC capital that is 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 a finite amount of money. You really don't have revenue coming in right like look at look at any of the big startups that, that don't really have a ton of revenue uh yet and you're like there's there's a burn rate and there are there's a known date that that money is going to run out right so you're, you're falling off a cliff and you're building the airplane on the way down and if you don't build it before you right. hit but it, in, your, in your all's cases it's uh, actually an airplane or a <laughs> rocket or rocket yeah right right well good luck 
Good luck with both of you to that. I mean, uh, where can people uh, where can people send their well wishes and uh, and flower emojis if needed? Uh, what, what, are, what are your Twitter handles? Uh, um, yeah, so um, my my Twitter handle uh, is Brent. Uh, sorry, my for Brent, my Twitter handle is uh, at KB One LQD. It's my call sign. That's uh, Kilo Bravo One uh, Lima Quebec Delta. Yeah, and uh, for for me, uh, it's uh, at KB One. LQC. So just one consecutive letter earlier. <laughs> that was not planned. You that guys was made a real easy. I know, made it real easy. <laughs> um, did, yeah, we, did, so... we, did we mention we're twins? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. Um, right. right. <laughs> yeah. And then also, if people are interested, um, the at relativity space, because uh, we're not really in stealth mode, uh, that you got some really cool stuff coming out uh, being shared on Twitter. I think, I believe there's an Instagram. There's definitely a LinkedIn. Um, as well, so uh, yep. some really cool stuff. Yeah, it sounds like LinkedIn's another good place. Yeah, to LinkedIn's reach you a guys, great place so to reach me. Yeah, I love that too. Yeah, and that would be just yep, my likewise. name, Bryce. Awesome. <laughs> look, for, yeah, look for Bryce in the aerospace industry, right? Yeah, yeah, I believe mine's uh, Brenton Salmi. Yeah, should be on there. Cool. Well, guys, thanks for coming. I mean, like this has been a whirlwind, of course. Uh, you know, uh, and like I said, we could probably talk more about it. Maybe we will in the future as uh, you know Faraday comes back and as you uh, announce more about your the progress of your planes <laughs> racing towards the ground. Um, <laughs> Hopefully not. I mean, towards the sky, of course. Uh, so yeah, thank thank you for being on the show, and uh, I appreciate you yeah, talking totally. about all the uh, always love talking research. electronics, yeah. rockets, awesome. and everything. Great to be here. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah, talk to you soon. Yeah, bye. Thank Thanks. you.